Hello and welcome to Watch From Home Theater, our little corner of the internet here at IGN and Cinefix, where we get to watch movies together even while we are properly social distanced. I am Clint Gage. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we've got some very special guests for a live commentary to Rogue One, a Star Wars story. But now, here's what you got to do to watch along. If you got Disney+, Plus, go ahead and get Rogue One queued up to the very beginning of the movie, uh, right there before the Lucasfilm logo starts up. If you own it on iTunes or Blu-ray, same deal. Queue it up. Uh, if you've got a hard copy, sometimes they got all that FBI warning stuff. Just get past that. Get to the right movie right there in front of the Lucasfilm logo. That's where we're going to be starting from here in a minute. Uh, now, if you don't have any of those things, Disney Plus is offering a free 14-day trial. There's a link in the description. Uh, so go get yourself signed up for free so that you can sync up with us as we're watching along. Uh, while you're down there in the description, there's also another link uh, to the IGN store. And if you use the pro promo code ROGUE, you'll get an extra five bucks off of any Star Wars short shirt uh, in the IGN store. So if you're not currently wearing a Star Wars t-shirt, here's your chance to get one five bucks off at the IGN store. So that is enough business. Uh, while you guys take care of all that stuff, let me introduce my co-host this week, Max Scoville. Max, how hey, you doing, man? How's it going? Welcome back for another week of Watch From Home Theater. I think I pretty much just forced my way in here. I just was like, oh, you're watching Star Wars? I like Star Wars. Let's watch Star Wars. We can yeah, watch Star look, Wars. You didn't give us much choice. It had to be you. Uh, but the aforementioned very special guests, we have our Rogue One writers, Gary Witta and Chris Weiss. Guys, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having us. Thanks so much for having us. Good to be here. Thanks for, uh, for joining us from your quarantine. I am, uh, as you can see shoved into a dark corner of my garage uh, this week. It's the only space I get to call my own. Um, but uh, you guys look a little more comfortable than I am. Honestly, Chris looks Gary, very comfortable. Chris looks down yeah, casual. I'm, I'm here in my, my boudoir. The children are, are outside dominating the rest of the house. And I, almost certainly they will interrupt this at some point. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm mostly concerned about uh, not having too much of a shot of my uh, waddle waddle um but uh, so i'll be adjusting as, as it's all we go about that along. myspace angle you gotta have the camera mm -hmm. coming down on you no, i don't know the angles uh gary how about how about you um this is the welcome to my uh, my own boudoir this is my uh, my office here at home this is where i work uh it's also where i stream that's where i have the fancy lightings uh twitch.tv uh slash gary witter animal crossing mornings every morning at 9 a.m i like to play animal crossing and i usually stream wednesday nights as well this is actually my regular streaming night i bumped that because i'm doing this instead but after we're done with the movie here i am going to start my regular stream over on my twitch channel so if anyone here wants to come over maybe we'll do like a little after party back at my place i'll do some additional q a <laughs> um uh, uh let's see let's see how it goes nice the after after party over there on right. gary switch um well, let, let's talk briefly uh, while everybody's still getting queued up. Let's let's st start talking about this movie, Rogue One. So the, one of the things we wanted to talk to you guys about, the, the idea for the movie uh, originally came from, from John Knoll, correct? The, That's right. The... John, John is um, the chief creative officer at ILM, uh, and he's a Stone Cold genius. He and his brother also invented Photoshop. Uh, it's it, it, like when I first met him as a nerd, knowing his history and all of the amazing things that he'd done working on the Star Wars movies for decades, uh, a legend at Industrial Light and Magic. I was very, very nervous to meet him. Uh, but he was the guy that first came up with the idea of, hey, let's 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 do movies outside of the saga. We can tell all kinds of other stories. And he was the guy that came up with the idea of, hey, why don't we tell the story of how the rebels uh, stole the Death Star plans and created the events, the events that led up. Uh, to the original movie. He took the idea to Kathy Kennedy and pitched it to her. Uh, she really liked it, thought it was a cool idea. And uh, they then somehow found me and, and asked me to take John's initial story ideas. He had like a couple of little documents, like two or three pages of, of a rough story outline, very, very early versions of the Jyn Erso, uh, K2SO type characters, and a, and a very kind of rough uh, plan for like what the story would be. And I kind of took it from there, developed the story, wrote the first draft of the script. Chris came on after me, made it infinitely better. Uh, Tony Gilroy, uh, the, the last leg of the the, the kind of the, the writers relay race, and um, the result is what we're all about to watch. Yeah, and so so you guys, the work you guys did on the on the movie didn't didn't overlap then. No, uh, I mean we it, it, it's it, like like Gary said, it's kind of a relay race, you know that you, you sort of get exhausted 
<laughs> and put out to pasture and then hand it on to somebody else. I mean, it, you know, th that's kind of the, the, the great thing and the sad thing sometimes about working on Star Wars is that you know, it's, it's more of a public trust than like something that any one director or, or writer owns. So you know you're going to serve your part and hope you kind of move the ball forward as well as you can. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so uh, Gary and I got to know each other afterwards, actually, sort of uh, comparing notes and, uh, and uh, battle yeah. stories. Yeah, sat next to each other at the premiere. Aww. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when, our, when, when our names came up on the screen, uh, the screen, we kind of nudging each other, like, can you believe this is happening? Like, it was still, still surreal. Every, every time uh, Chris and uh, I see our names up there in the blue letters, it's just, it's just magic because you grew up watching those movies with the, the, you know, the Starfield and the John Williams music playing sure. and seeing George Lucas's name up on, in those in the classic blue letters. When yeah. I, I saw my name in those blue letters, I, I almost cried. It was like the, 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 like the 12 year old fanboy in me practically exploded it was ridiculous yeah it's it's really special i um and you know that one of the interesting things about seeing it at the premiere was like w once you you stop working uh, on the movie essentially you go dark um right like your your lucasfilm email is shut down and everything because security is such a huge concern um that they want to sort of keep tamp down on as much information as possible so there's like as fresh as possible when it comes out so both gary and i were seeing a movie that um, we uh, hadn't worked on in a while, and that had ch had ch changed, of course. Like I, yeah. I, my my bit of work was over the moment that um, that the production moved to to London. Um, you know, my wife and I were going to have a baby, and we s stuck around in in LA. Um, and so it was it was a weird mixture of sort of seeing a movie that you'd worked on, and also seeing a, a fresh like new Star Wars movie. Which is so exciting! It's like the best of of both worlds. Yeah, They're it's a weird kinds. hybrid experience. I, I, you know, Gareth had shown me little pieces that he had cut together. I had seen like rough versions of it, but not a finished version. Uh, as Chris said, the first time that we saw the whole thing fully finished, cut together with all the visual effects and everything, like fully done, was at the premiere. And it's a weird kind of hybrid experience because there's a lot that you recognize. Oh yeah, there's the scene that I wrote, and there's the scene that I was on set. Uh, the day that they shot it and a lot of it is familiar but then there's other things that you're genuinely seeing for the first time you're like oh my god that's so cool like so you're kind of watching it from the inside and the outside both as a fan and as someone who worked on the movie yeah now uh the other thing that, that we'll be doing tonight is um if you're watching at home wherever you're watching just leave a comment or a question there there in the comments um and we will get to it uh if we can for example this is a good segue here. There's a uh, something that you just kind of touched on. This is a question from uh, Kyle Steves, who's watching on Cinefix. Uh, how does working on Rogue One compare to other projects in terms of fan expectations? We touched on that a little bit. Like, is there a comparison? Um, I, I think it's a question of degree, right? Um, because uh, obviously the 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 desire not to drop the ball is always big no matter what the movie is but um but when it's star wars and when especially when it's something that you grew up watching like i remember very vividly seeing the first star wars at age seven right in a movie theater and that changed my life um so it's not just the expectation of fans who are rightly concerned like what's going to happen with this kind of public trust of this franchise but also like how are you not not going to let down your seven-year-old self um, so yeah, the, the pressure is big. I think, I, I don't know what, what Gary thinks about it, but the only way to, to, to get on with it is sort of to, to try to not think about it, to try right. to, um, kind of cordon yourself off from, from, um, from the Twitter sphere during the time that you're, you're working on it. Yeah. I mean, from my point of view, coming at it from very much as a fanboy, someone who knows every frame of the original trilogy, like, you know, back to front. I definitely felt the weight of that responsibility. And to be fair to Lucasfilm, that all, all of that pressure was internal. Like they they know they they were just, you know, enjoy yourself, have fun, like make a movie. It's gonna be cool. But I was like, oh my God, what if we screw this up? What if we screw this up? Like all my writers' neuroses were kind of in in overdrive. Um, and particularly because I feel like there's something unique to Rogue One in that it's a direct companion piece to the original movie, the one that started it all. Yeah. I remember saying to Gareth, this is kind of like being asked to build an extension onto the side of the Taj Mahal. And if the extension is ugly, it's going to blight the actual Taj Mahal forever. And I remember Gareth going, oh, my God, why did you have to say that? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I really should have kept that thought to myself. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing about, you know, in the end, I think we did 
a good job. And the, 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 the greatest compliment that I've received, and I've heard this from, from a number of people, is they think it actually makes the original movie better. It's a really fun experience to watch the two movies back to back. Because in now when you watch A New Hope and Luke Skywalker gets those Death Star plans, now you know how much was sacrificed to get them this far. And they wind up in the in the in the in the in the hands of this nobody farm kid. And you're like, oh geez, you better not screw this up. So um, the you know, watching them back to back, and the, the movies were always the, the, the Rogue One was always intended to kind of dovetail right into a new hope. It's, my, it's actually my favorite part of the movie is the very end when you start to realize, oh shit, we're watching the beginning of the original Star Wars now. That's so cool. And I think in that regard, uh, we did a good job. Now, Gary, I have a question for you. Um, your background is originally in in games, game stuff. You used to do uh, games press, and you've written a bunch of a bunch of games. Uh, when you first heard the sort of premise for this, were you like they they tackled that in the first level of Dark Forces? Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because one of the things I had to do in researching this was look at all the kind of versions of how the it's, this is not the first time that the that the the story of the death star plans being stolen has been told it's just been the first time it's been done as actual canon you know done, as you know all of all of the extended universe what's now called the legends universe was never really officially canon those stories existed but they weren't like canonized into like the, the official star wars history so Kyle Katarn and the death star plans and Galen Marrick and all these other versions of uh, the story that I've been told, I mean, I, I looked at them, but I never really felt like we wanted to crib anything from them. I felt like we could tell our own original story. So even even coming from a gaming background, I never really felt any responsibility to those other other versions of the story. People, I saw people online think that, or some people think that Jin Erso is a nod to Jan Ors, who was sort of Kyle Katarn's uh, counterpart in Dark Forces? Is that just a totally... Like, I don't think so. Hours You'd have to ask name. John Null. He came up with the name Jin Erso, but as far as I know, Jin gaming nerds so i i, I my, my guess is no i don't think so mm -hmm. <laughs> all right well let's let's get into the movie we got one one more thing i want to talk about before we start playing the movie uh and that is uh part of the reason you guys are joining us today is to raise awareness for uh, a couple of charities um and gary you chose stack up uh, yeah stackup.org they do they do amazing work i first met them at pax last year and it's a tremendous organization uh, it's founded and run mostly by uh, military, military veterans. And what they do is they support through gaming, um, active service and retired military. For the active service guys, they send out uh, what they call supply drops, like, you know, Playstations and Xboxes and video games for uh, guys who are downrange, uh, you know, serving overseas. Uh, and there's a lot of downtime in the military. They sit around, you know, with nothing to do. Video games help them pass the time. And then perhaps even more importantly, after the fact, they provide uh, therapy and counseling services. Uh, their, their big thing is to help reduce um, uh, suicide amongst military veterans, which is a really serious problem that we don't talk enough about in this country. And Stack Up is one of the countries, uh, sorry, one of the ca charities doing uh, terrific work in the area. So I'm happy to support them. That's great. That's great. And uh, Chris, you chose the uh, International Rescue Committee. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, they do amazing work uh, with refugees. I think that some, you know, one of the phenomena of of the uh, pandemic is that quite reasonably people sort of start to think about uh, what's needed most at home there's kind of not just a constriction in how people are uh spending their money in terms of leisure but also in terms of charity and it's natural to want to give money to you know help uh first responders get ppe and uh to help you know feed people affected by the COVID crisis uh i, I think you know every once in a while we should also realize that this is kind of uh, taking uh, it, it means that uh, the International Rescue Committee and other um, uh, and other charities that are working worldwide are uh, missing out on what would normally be their sources of funding. So um, uh, Gary's charity sounds fantastic, and I uh, there's a number of sort of domestic charities I love to support, but um, but International Rescue Committee is doing some great work uh, worldwide um, in Syria just to to start. Well, we've got links in the description for you guys to read up uh, more on those uh, charities. Thank you very much, uh, guys. Um, but let's get started. Uh, again, uh, wherever you're watching, uh, leave a comment or a question, and we'll try to get to it as we go. But um, everybody, get your movies queued up, and let's go ahead and start it in three, two, one, play. Let's go. Just that Lucasfilm logo alone gives you a chill, I think. I it's love nice, seeing that. It's nice, right? It's a warm blanket of a logo. 
Yes. Now, the way that the movie opens is really the, one of the first interesting conversations that Gareth and I had. Well, well should there be an opening crawl? That was um, my that, first question for you guys, too. I wanted to, one like, of the, one of how the hard was it to not write one? We, but I, I did write one. You did? You'll you never could. see it, but <laughs> I did. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote more than one. Uh, back it back when we were still experimenting with the idea of maybe doing one but one of the things that that we arrived at fairly early on in the process was realizing that it was okay to liberate ourselves from the traditional storytelling language of of Star Wars and a lot of the a lot of the visual tropes the certain you know the iris wipes uh, the opening crawl things like that um, we felt like these standalone movies had more license than the saga films to try and do something a little, a little bit different. One of the other conversations we had here is, can, can we do a time jump? What you're seeing here takes place like 20 or so years before the rest of the movie. Mm. Star Wars has never done that in the saga films, never did a time jump. We did one, and once we realized that it was okay to do that, we we felt a lot more creative freedom to tell the story the way we wanted to tell it. Yeah, that, that, that reminds me of this funny moment where I, at one point I was talking with Gareth about a montage, like, you know, would we possibly have a montage sequence? And he said, a montage in Star Wars. Interesting. <laughs> and I knew that he would never do it. Uh, there are certain things that are just not Star Warsy. Um, yeah, and it's and and it's and, it, and that's and that was the thing. It's like what, what, the, the 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 first conversation was, can we try and do different things? We decided yes, but then you st but then beyond that, it's like, well, you still have kind of a gut feeling for what feels like Star Wars and what doesn't. This is actually the very first scene that I wrote. Very first scene. Um, uh, Gareth and I talked a lot about how much we love the opening of Inglorious Bastards, if you remember that, with the French farmhouse, where mm -hmm. Christoph Waltz, the Nazi, comes to interrogate the French farmer. And this this scene is was very much inspired by that. Krennic is basically uh, the, the the Christoph Waltz Nazi uh, in this movie, coming to uh, interrogate the poor um, uh, the poor innocents uh, who have to hide this uh, this girl. Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm surprised that but actually one of the more direct cinematic references and influences in the film. I'm surprised more people uh, didn't pick up on it. But you should have um, you should have had him ask for a cup of blue milk. Like yeah, like, <laughs> milk, right? like a comically big cigar. Yeah, maybe. Right, yeah. Uh, this was I mean, shot in um, Iceland, if I recall. Uh, hats off to Greg Fraser, amazing oh DP. Who would what a cinematographer. Uh, who would come off shooting uh, Zero Dark Thirty at the time, so you can sort of feel some of that. Yeah, um, military and he went on to shoot influence. The Mandalorian as well. Um, just an extraordinary um, uh, DP. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think the look of this film owes so much to, to Gareth's um, sense of visuals as well. He's really yeah. an extraordinary. He's, he's an incredible visualist. If you have never seen his debut movie, Monsters, uh, go find it. It's incredible. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Now, uh, G Gary, it, it might be worth pointing out that at one point here, Jin's mum was a Jedi. And that, I don't know uh, if that's ever been talked about, but yeah, in the original version here, and the, and the Kyber crystal, I think, is like the last tiny piece of that that's left. But the original idea was that she was a she was a Jedi in in hiding, and um, that I mean, it was, it was one of the first things that got that got killed, and rightly so. Again, and, and that was kind of a, a vestige of me as a fanboy wanting to feel like we, we were checking all the Star Wars boxes because it felt it, as much as I love the whole military angle of Star Wars you know the rebellion and the, and the empire I remember saying to Gareth and to Doug Chang who was in the room as well um that this is going to be the very first Star Wars movie that doesn't have a lightsaber in it like how does that make you feel and like and, and they were like it makes us feel great like we want to do those different things of course it ended up not being true we have an amazing lightsaber sequence at the end of the movie we'll get there anyway. yeah um, but you know, one of, one of the things that I learned early on in the process was like, and I think Chris touched on this as well, you've got to leave the fanboy part of yourself at the door because sometimes it's not helpful to be too much of a fanboy because you do, I think, otherwise have that instinct to want to check all the boxes, but you don't necessarily have to just check the boxes that need to be checked to tell this particular story. Yeah. There's something interesting that Gareth eventually was, was keen on, which was to imagine a world there was no direct evidence of the force. Um, right. And and so what was the period like before Luke Skywalker came along um, and met Obi-Wan and there was there was this new hope. It's a kind of a, a period of, of possible despair and how people were going to hold themselves together in, in the meanwhile. 
Um, and, and, and of course, one of the things you're seeing here in this early, in this opening scene is just, and it's all through the movie, is like this movie is an acting tour de force all the way through. You've got like Mads Mikkelsen and Ben Mendelsohn in this scene, and it's just amazing actor after amazing actor. And I remember I'd sit around talking to Gareth about fantasy casting, like who we would put in these roles. And I'd say, do you think we get, get that person? And Gareth was like, it's Star Wars. I think we have a good chance of getting whoever we want. <laughs> and in the end, you know, we did. Ben, uh, Gareth, Ben Mendelsohn was all Gareth. He, he was upset. He had seen Ben Mendelsohn in some early, in some of his early work and really, really wanted him. Um, and of course, he was perfect. Mads, who's a tremendous actor. Mads Mikkelsen and I were actually inducted into the 501st Legion on the same day together, which was a very, a very nice treat for me. Yeah, um, congratulations. Mads, 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 of course, who um, is mostly known for playing bad guys, I thought it was very, very clever to cast him kind of against type here. Um, yeah, Mads and I did actually disagree about whether or not he plays a good guy or a bad guy in this movie. He thinks he plays a bad guy. I think he plays a good guy. But maybe, really, I think it's a little bit of both. It's a, ref it's a bad guy who becomes a reformed good guy, which is always my favorite kind of character. Yeah, that's so, interesting. He, like, Gary, I'll, I'll do you one better on that, actually, which is that where I, I think where Gareth and I eventually got with the backstory of that was that he originally had intended to be able to use kyber crystals as kind of a source of energy for the galaxy so that there would be no more conflict. And it became weaponized. Right. Uh, under the kind and of I believe they actually touch on that in, the, in some of the uh, spin-off novels. That was always one of my favorite. They added after me, you know, the idea that kyber crystals were used and a power of the Death Star, I think, was an idea that had been floating around and we kind of crystallized it, so forgive the pun, in this movie. But I always loved the idea because Jedi lightsabers are powered by kyber crystals, right? And so the idea that mm. this crystal, which had once been used to power the weapons that protected peace and justice in the galaxy, are now powering the weapon that threatens all of that. And I don't know how much of that was really deliberate, but like after the fact, it kind of occurred to me that there was a, there was a nice bit of poetry in that, in that idea. The Stormtrooper doll is a, is a Gareth touch. That's yes, it very, is. Yes, it uh, is. Classic uh, Gareth Edwards. And this scene, and again, this scene right changed around. in many ways. Jin's mother was a Jin's mother was a uh, and it changed in many big ways. But like in in many ways, a lot of the original DNA from my scene is still here. The idea that you know um, hmm. Jin is orphaned, runs off, hides from Krennic, is found by Saw Gerrera, who adopts her and becomes kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a kind of a weird. Um, uh, uh, mentor, father figure, all of that DNA is from my original story and from my original script. And as much as things change, it's still incredibly gratifying to me to see that so much of that original DNA that I put into the movie made it into the final film. How did Saw Gerrera get involved? Because he was, he'd appeared in the Clone Wars before. Gareth was really, really interested in the idea of um, it not being black and white. Uh, that, it, that there'd be shades of gray on both sides, that there would be good people on the Empire side and bad people on the, rebe on the, re on the rebel side. Because that, of course, you know, reflects real life more in a more nuanced way. And, so, and, and we, we very quickly uh, honed in on the idea of, a, of a, an extremist militant rebel, someone who legitimately had crossed over from being a freedom fighter into just being a terrorist. And we were sitting around with Kiri Hart, who used to be the head of Lucasfilm's uh, story group and who helped guide the creative process, and we talked about that idea. So if only we want, like, we want who's our Colonel Kurtz? Like, we want the guy at the end of the river, you know, the Marlon Brando, Colonel Kurtz, Apocalypse Now type character who's gone off the deep end. Um, and Kiri said, well, you know what? George actually created a character for the Clone Wars that might fit that really well, called Saw Gerrera. I, had not, I was not familiar, but went back and watched the Clone Wars and saw this character in Saw Gerrera and thought, oh, wow, he's perfect. What would he look like? He was already kind of a fanatic in the Clone Wars. What would he look like? Uh, 20 years later, and that's how the character of Saw Gerrera, Forrest's character in the movie, uh, came to be. Diego Luna. This is, this is, the, these are, these are some, this is Tony Gilroy stuff. This is some of the stuff that was added uh, fairly late uh, in the process. Yeah, I was yeah so the, the, since a lot of the story of this movie, like, like you were talking about earlier, the relay race aspect of, of, sort of the writing of it. I, I might I might do a, a scene check periodically. Like, okay, mm -hmm. whose who scene was this? Yeah, I think this is Tony Gilroy's. Yeah, um, and for a long time, there, there was a sort of a dramatic irony to whether the Rebels knew just how bad this uh, mysterious um, weapon that the Empire was building would be. Um, and my guess is that in between Gary and myself's uh, time on it, the decision was just made to be a lot more clear about um, 
Yeah, in the danger. original, in the earlier versions, the Death Star is something that Jin goes and finds, and she begins to put together. It's much, much more kind of like Zero Dark Thirty, where she's putting together the clues of, you know, of Bin Laden is in this house in Pakistan. The Empire is building this terrible weapon, and it was a battle for Jin to try and convince the rebels to take it seriously. And I think the feeling was like that was too much of a slow burn. And so what we, what happened in this scene? I was going to say we, but not really because I actually I had nothing to do with this scene. I think it's a really cool scene, which to kind of front load that much more and introduce the idea that the Empire was building a planet killing weapon like right up front. And they're also definitely introducing the idea that Cassian can be uh, quite dark, uh, right? He, he yeah, kills his own that, so that, no, there's a terrific moment, right? Kind of. Where is it? It's when I, it's after he kills this rebel, um, this rebel uh, uh, mole here. Um, there's a look. Watch out for it because you're going to see it in just a moment. He has to kill this guy because he's got. He's now got information that can that is, that is vital to the future of the rebellion. But the only way he's going to get it out is if he, if, if he sacrifices this this good man. And right here, just a beautiful bit of acting as Diego really He's just lost another little bit of his soul uh, in 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 the fight for for justice. Um, you know, there's all this, the, you know, your, your morality, uh, is often your first, uh, victim. And that's one of my favorite little pieces of acting. It's very subtle, but it's one of my favorite pieces of, uh, of acting in the movie. And this is Jeddah, which Chris came up with. Uh, well, uh, at Gareth's <laughs> prompting, at Gareth's prompting for a while, we had Ord Mandel. We um, had Ord Mandel, yeah. And, a, and, and then, the, then it sort of shifted a bit to the notion of an occupied territory like uh, like in Casablanca, right? right? And, and so this has a, a bit of a flavor of that, which is um, a part of the empire that has been taken over, um, that is under the kind of uh, violent oversight of, of the emperor, yeah. empire. Well, a, a, lot of, a lot of what happens often in the development of a movie is consolidation in order to make the movie not cost $500 million. And in the original drama, Jin, went to Ord Mandel, which is a, you know, a planet that's referenced in The Empire Strikes Back, to find uh, an arms dealer who could help her find Saw Gerrera. There was a bunch of action that happened on Ord Mandel, and then she went to another planet where Saw Gerrera was living on this, this kind of hidden moon. His kind of splinter group, his militant faction was, was on a moon called Yared, I believe, but it was a separate planet. And, I believe, and, and as the story kind of consolidated down, like we can only go to so many planets, um, it, it, uh, that like, Jeddah kind of, became, kind of filled in for both of those, both of those planets. Yeah, I mean, you do you you do sit in, in a meeting where they tell you to lose a planet, um, <laughs> yeah, because that, there's a, a budget shortfall. It's it, it's amazing to think that Star Wars actually has budget, but it does because you just does. sort of think they just make it. I remember saying to Gareth, "We can't throw everything in the kitchen sink at this movie when it's Star Wars. When when can we do it?" But you know, budget realities yeah. play a part even at the very very highest end of movie making. I'll give you another example. Originally, you saw. Um, the rebels uh, at the beginning, the rebel base is actually on Dantooine and you see the rebels evacuate Dantooine and move to Yavin 4. Um, uh, but it, it didn't, it didn't really accomplish anything in the story other than to kind of nod to the Star Wars fans. Hey, remember Dantooine? Like when there was a, there was an evacuated rebel base there. Well, now you get to see them evacuate it, but it didn't move the story forward and it would have cost a ton of money. So we, we, so we lost that and just all of the action takes place uh, on Yavin 4 and we saved a bunch of money. Again, yeah, this is, I believe, again, this is Tony Gilroy stuff, I believe. Uh, I think that's included. right. Yeah. Uh, you know, you see the development of Jin from, you know, at one point, Jin was already a rebel soldier. Um, we toyed with various other possibilities that she was a deserter, that she was a, um, you know, sort of a, a, a Ray like scavenger, but obviously you can't do that once you learn what the other, uh, what the other hand of the Star Wars universe is doing. Yeah. Like I mean, that's the the wild thing is that when you're when you're sort of doing this, um, you uh, somebody's calling me. <laughs> the, um, the 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 title cards here is another thing that uh, I didn't know we were going to do. The quite late, and I think the feeling was considering that this was a military zero dark thirty type movie that often used those kind of you know location cards, you know, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean and stuff like that that they that they felt appropriate the only time that they, they don't use a title card is mustafa because i think they wanted to um preserve the mystery of that location until they and have the fans go oh shit this is mustafa rather than just spell it out for the audience i was honest, i really i like that logic a lot because like mustafa would be totally under wraps imperially speaking like that would right. be one of those off the maps planets right the first day i walked onto this set i almost cried because they had rebuilt yeah. this set from the original New Hope construction plans. 
And it was like stepping back in time to 1977. And I, ju I just welled up with emotion. It was incredible being on this set. Yeah, and it's his, fabulous. The amazing Genevieve Riley, who played Mon Mothma in, the, in, in scenes that were cut out of, I believe, Revenge of the Sith. And um, it was my idea to bring Moth, Mon Mothma back into the movie because she's one of my favorite characters from Return of the Jedi. I wanted to see a younger Mon Mothma. And Lucasfilm went and found Genevieve. And they said, hey, do you want to... Uh, she's already per perfect for it. And she's just wonderful in this film. I'm so, I'm so glad that Mon Mothma's in the movie. I'm a, I'm a really, really big fan of Return of the Jedi. I don't care what the haters say. Return of the Jedi is one of my favorite Star Wars movies. And I put all kinds of little nods and homages to Return of the Jedi uh, in this movie. And having Mon Mothma in the movie is, is, is one of those things. I'm so glad they got Genevieve Riley because she's just perfect for this role. Love an alliterative character name as well. You, know? you got to love it. You got to love it. Yeah, this, so this scene is, is one that seems fairly pivotal in, in the whole movie. Like, here's, here's where we're sort of heading off uh, on, on the mission. How, how much mm -hmm. did, this movie, did this scene get worked on and retooled? Quite a bit. Um, let me see. There was a point where it was really it, its closest um, analog was um, was the scene in Apocalypse Now in which um, Martin Sheen's character is told to go and assassinate Kurtz. Right, at the, it's kind of a smoky room with a lot of conspirators, um, and this is a much more stripped down version. Uh, and and sort of there, there's less intrigue and and more about sort of trying to really set the plot in motion. And this is when we first talk about Saw Gerrera. And again, I love the idea that not all rebels are claiming the Emperor. There are, in fact, you know, this is this is the core of the rebellion. This is like the official licensed version. But Saw Gerrera, who was previously a rebel general, at some point had a falling out with Dodonna and Mon Mothma and the other rebel leadership over the way that the war against the Empire was being prosecuted and decided that he was going to go and set up his own uh, extremist faction. And that has become like a huge PR nightmare for the rebellion because he's going around, you know, attacking uh, civilians and blowing up all kinds of things that aren't helpful to the, to the larger effort against the Empire, but they can't control him. And so I, lo I love that idea that, again, there's not, there is one rebellion, but there's also these other uh, more militant factions out there that aren't, and, and they're not, not all necessarily sil singing from the same hymn book. I love that idea. And here's my other favorite. Jimmy Smits is so great. One Jimmy of the things Smith. I love, one of the things Jimmy I love Smith about this gets movie, a pop every time. I, I think it. this movie really beautifully bridges the gap between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. Oh, look and, at and this. one of the ways in which it does it is bringing back Jimmy Smits as Bail Organa. And, he, and he's aged perfectly into the role as well. The length yeah, of time between the, the prequel trilogies answer. and this one. But meanwhile, look at Yavin. Oh my God, look at just getting to see more of the, look how good of the this face. Movie. My God. Gareth um, just shot the shit out of this movie. Me, this is another great example too of, of Gareth. It, it's it's always his sense of scale. Like I, mm -hmm. everything from tiny, tiny details to giant wide shots always look really beautiful and lived yeah. in. Like, and, and you mentioned Monster and obviously Godzilla was another one of his. Um, it's, that's one thing I've always been so impressed with by his stuff. It's just that Gareth, scale Gareth can is compose huge. a shot on like almost, almost yeah. unlike almost anyone I know. He's he's phenomenally talented, sort of, sort of thing. And it is. It's such a thrill to see this base that we saw so little of back in the day because budget was so limited to really fully build it out in this way. And that and that, and that set was a fully contiguous interior exterior. You could walk from inside that rebel base where they just were earlier all the way outside uh, in in one continuous shot. That whole thing was built in one location. Uh, it's a place called Cardington Sheds in uh, Southern England. And they did, a, they did an amazing job. They suited you up, didn't they, Gary? For one they of these did. They, I got Are you in the up. background there somewhere? I, I, I know my, 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 my uh, pilot, who I uh, call Red Zero, uh, uh, died heroically on the cutting room floor. They <laughs> suited me up. I got to do a whole thing where I walked across the tarmac with my helmet under my armor, walked right past Felicity. Uh, I was so happy when I saw it back in uh, on the monitor. And the bastards cut it at the last minute. Wow. <laughs> you were still there. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. I was there. No one can take that away from me. <laughs> can you tell us about K2SO and how that how he came together? Because I get the sense that's a lot of Alan Tudyk in there. But like, what was he like on paper? K2SO is a great example of how one character can have many fathers. In the sense that John originally created him. He came up with the name K2SO. And he was originally a um, rebel um, uh, I think it was called like a rebel logistics droid. And, and John just said, I think he looks like a black C-3PO. And I was like, okay. 
Uh, and I couldn't tell, like, do you mean black like the metal is black or black like Sam Jackson? Like, I couldn't tell you exactly what he meant, but I think he meant a little bit of both. Like, he wanted him to have a little bit of attitude. And one of my big contributions was I had I had this idea, well, what if he was an Imperial droid who had been captured by the Rebellion and then reprogrammed? Like, you can see how that could come in really handy in all kinds of situations. And we always, and, and that stuck, and, and that's who K2S, uh, K2SO now is. He's a uh, recaptured, reprogrammed uh, Imperial droid. Um, and I gave him, I started to give him his acerbic personality. We never really talked about this in depth. The idea was that when he, when K2SO worked for the Empire, he was very, very limited and restricted in how, you know, yes sir, no sir. He had to kind of do as he was told. But once he was reprogrammed and kind of liberated by the rebellion and he was able to kind of speak his mind, boy, is he going to do it. So that's why, oh, that's good. why he talks back to everyone. And then Alan Tudyk came along and, and really kind of imbued him with that comic uh, personality and then Chris and Tony, you know, continue to rewrite his dialogue and give him more life. So, you know, me, John, Alan, uh, Chris, Tony, everyone, everyone has a little piece of kind of K2SO's parentage. Right. That actually leads to a question that uh, showed up on uh, YouTube uh, from Inverse Agonist, uh, who's watching. Do you guys know who was cast in the roles when you were writing? If you did, how did that affect how you wrote the characters? If you didn't, how did you feel about the the, the casting? So Alan Tudyk is one that you that you started before you knew he was on, I guess. I think, yeah. Uh, so m most of the casting happened after the fact. The only after I was the only ones that I knew for sure were going to get cast were Ben Mendelsohn as Krennic because Gareth was absolutely insistent, um, and Forrest Whitaker. Like there was only ever one choice uh, for Saw Gerrera, and that was Forrest Whitaker. And we're very fortunate. Uh, that he said yes. I remember it came down. I'm not going to say who they were, but it came down to three choices for Jin. That was the final shortlist, and Felicity ended up uh, winning out. And I'm glad she did because she's she's terrific. She's so fabulous. This... Yeah, I, I was around when some of the casting was coming online. Uh, so uh, when Jung Won and Donnie Yen were cast, when Mads was cast, um, Alan Tudyk. So uh, you know, it, it obviously, it's great to be able to sort of figure out how somebody's going to sound based upon. Uh, what you know of, of what they've done before. And Chris Bodie, right here, this is a character you brought into the story, wasn't it? It was, was it? God, <laughs> memory becomes hazy, but yeah. Who can tell? Um, I, listen, by, by the way, the, the one soapbox I'm going to get up on about is is Pow Gullet. It's, oh, no, Boar Gullet at some Borgullet. point. Um, I don't know if we've seen him yet. Um, yeah, we, just, him we just scale. heard that he's, he's on his way. Look at the yeah, sense this of scale from this Gareth, is, my God. Those tiny this is little Star Destroyers up against the giant disc of the... It's this, is, this is actually shot. another one of my favorite little things that I got to give you here is, and we'll talk about Tarkin in a moment, like I wanted to see the final completion of the Death Star. And it always occurs to me that the actual kind of laser array, like the dangerous part, they would build off site. And, it, and only after they had tested it and were, and, and were sure that it was safe would they install it as a separate piece into the into the actual Death Star itself. And uh, this was a scene that I wrote into the script. You know, I remember I remember writing in the script, we're witnessing a historic moment in the history of Star Wars, the final completion of the Death Star. So to, to see that dish finally go in. And again, when you when you write these scenes in your head, you kind of imagine them, imagine what they'll look like, but you never imagine they're gonna look this good. Um, and it really, really, really was an incredible thing to see brought to life. Um, so Tarkin, wow. Um, you know, this was one of the things that John Knowles said that, uh, they could do yeah. and they kind of built the, um, parachute as the, as they were falling. Um, and, uh, he, you know, one interesting thing about it is that obviously you can't scan, uh, uh, Peter Cushing, but what, what John Knowles explained to me they were able to do was to take, um, shots from, uh, from the original Star Wars and also unused takes um, and uh, treat when he would turn in a shot as though it were, you know, their version of a 3D scan, right? Um, so to extract this very accurate image of what he looked like was this kind of extraordinary yeah, technical there's some real, there's some really amazing stories behind that. I remember saying to John, I feel like to be in the movie, like this, this movie literally takes place like in the hours and days before A New Hope. And so Tarkin's obviously in A New Hope is a critical figure uh, in, in on the Death Star. So if he's not there now, like where, where was he? And so I said to John, um, who, you know, is not only a, a writer on the movie, but also responsible for the visual effects. I feel like we want, I, I want to put Tarkin in the movie, but how do we accomplish that? And he said, don't worry about it. We'll figure that out. That's what we do here at ILM. We figure out how to do impossible things. 
And I, I took him at his word, but when I first wrote Tarkin into the movie, I wrote him like he was all shadow. He was kind of, you know, I was trying to give ILM as much wiggle room as possible. Like he, he didn't have a lot of dialogue. Uh, he wasn't in the movie a lot. And they eventually wrote him into the movie way more and gave him much more dialogue because ILM were, you know, were, were, were confident that they could really do it. Um, well, one of the things that they did that I thought was amazing because John knows everyone in the visual effects world. John actually found, I don't know if you remember, you probably won't remember this, but Peter Cushing was in a movie called Top Secret, the Val Kilmer movie from back in the 1980s. And for that movie, Peter Cushing had to be fitted, fitted with a prosthetic because there's like a visual gag where he has this huge eye. And so they, 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 took, a, they took a mold of his face, like a, like a 3D sculpt of his head. And John found that sculpt and 3D scans. I mean, sitting in someone's shelf in a, in a, in a prop workshop for decades, he found it brought it to ILM, 3D scanned it, and that ended up being a part of how they recreated Peter Cushing's face for Tarkin. That's incredible. The fact that all that stuff is still sitting around is... is oh, those we guys don't throw it. anything away. I know. We talked about it. We had Greg, Greg Nicotero on a couple of weeks ago, and we talked a lot about stuff like that, too. It's just like the amount of the props and everything and the molds that are all still there somewhere. You just mm -hmm. got to know where to look. So and again, yeah, and shots kind of... like this just to just a star destroyer kind of hanging in the in the mm -hmm. things that you've never seen in that was one of John's things. He said, "I want to see things that have never been seen in Star Wars before," and this movie is filled with stuff like that. Yeah. And yet, you and know, it... you also tie it to that um, the binoculars, uh, which are straight out of New Hope, right? Um, right. You know, the, the particular kind of video quality when you look through them, right? Uh, and all the, all the little furniture around them. Yeah, it's perfect, perfectly done. What I love about what Chris did with Jedi here was, again, like, again, this is a time, this is a military, it's not about the force, it's not about the Jedi. We're not going to have people running around in hoods and lightsabers. And yet, you want to have some kind of sense of, of, of that being still part of this universe. And I thought that what Chris brought to this with Jedi and the Temple of the Wills uh, and Chirrut being a, not a Jedi, but someone who feels it feels connected to the Force in some way, I thought was a really beautiful way to kind of bring some of the energy into the movie without it being like a big part of the movie. Well, thank you, Gary. It's very kind. Um, no, I thought it was yet, very clever. And yet, Ord Mantel was uh, was interesting too. I, I think yeah, that some was... of that some of that kind of comes out in um, in Last Jedi, actually, in the casino. Um, That's right. Yeah, scene, feels like yeah. you know the, there there are all these kind of modalities that get used and like nothing ever really gets um totally abandoned uh Borgullet, Borgullet. okay let's talk about Borgullet. let's talk about Borgullet. <laughs> now right he seems like a monster here it the first version of him this is this is you know my, my great sadness in life is that uh on the cutting room floor is a Borgullet who is a memory trader right he lives on memories and he especially uh so he, he especially delights in traumatic memories that they feed him they're, they're, they're more delicious to him um so there was at one point a kind of a, a Han space hannibal lecture scene where or gullet um mage Jin trade her um traumatic childhood memories for information that she wanted that is oh all i have God, to say dark. wow yeah <laughs> i it makes me sad that it's not in there, but and yet I understand. That's really cool, though. Yeah, that's yeah, a... that could be fun. But so, and, it, and it's generally true. Like I, I've, I've, I've got ideas to use them in. It's like one movie. I'll find a way to use them in favorite ideas that we that we all carry with us. And that's definitely true in Star Wars. Like the many, many things that you've seen in Star Wars start, it started as an idea for something else, didn't fit, and but it got repurposed elsewhere. Here we've got this this little cameo. Let's let's really guys. quickly talk about our guys here. The, the, oh, luckiest, the luckiest guys in the world. They just 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 uh, survived the destruction of Jeddah of Jeddah only to get killed by a Jedi the next day. Are they, right. they, they, are they, nothing from are they on their <laughs> they're on their way to to a, a ship to to head to Tatooine right now? I guess. Well, they they must have like had to drink it off in the most icy yeah. cantina, you know, and right. and just think about how relieved they were, and they got a little. A little loose, it, and then they got really, into the fight. Yeah, it really makes it. Uh, it, it puts their them being in that cantina in a new light. Like you know, just, you could you could read that into it is that having just yeah, they they, right. they they feel like they're in <laughs> just survived the destruction yeah. of Jeddah. And they, and they, but then they pick a fight with the wrong guy. This actually, uh, this actually uh, leans into. There's a question uh, from IGN YouTube channel. Uh, Jacob's Quest is the username. Are there any Easter eggs and references that you wanted to put in that didn't make the cut? Oh, so many. I mean, really, your first job when you're writing Star Wars is to try to sneak in names of 
family members, friends, things that you care about, um, and to see uh, if you can get away with it. And, and some of the time you do. And, like, that, and, and, there's, and there's a long history of that. I mean, many, many Star Wars names from the ones created on down come from really dumb places. Like, if you actually ask them, like, where did that name come from, they'll tell you a really silly story. Um, <laughs> but, do you have uh, any of the names that you came up with? for? for the oh, well, the, the, I mean, the classic one is, is the name of Scarif, the, the, the planet at the end, which is... Yeah, uh, that's my favorite. Which is a Starbucks barista's yeah, interpretation a, of Gareth saying, it's Gareth, when they ask yeah. what the... <laughs> I, said to, I said to Gareth, uh, I've named all the planets so far, it's time. You should name one. You should, you should have a planet, because I want to do it. I said, well, give it, give it a think. He said, what do you want me to name? I said, like the final planet where they steal the plans. He's like, okay, I'll go think about it. And our office was, was, a, a, was kind of adjoining the back of a Starbucks and Gareth would go there every day and he went there to get his Frappuccino, whatever. And, um, and he's English. So, you know, he has a very English accent. And the barista said, what's your name? And he said, Scarif, as in it's Gareth, it's Gareth. And they wrote Scarif, S-C-A-R-I-F on the cup. And Gareth brought the cup back to me. He said, look how they spelled my name today. Did anybody tell the barista about that? <laughs> I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, maybe she's heard it like through because that's a story that we've since told many, many times. It's a f yeah, but yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's that planet. The, this one of the most significant planets in the history of Star Wars was was named by a barista who misspelled Gareth's name on a coffee cup. Yeah, that's great. Uh, real, real quick, let's do a, do a real quick check in before this action sequence gets going here. But uh, if you're just joining us, um, we are watching Rogue One with Gary Whitta and Chris Weiss. If you want to join us, uh, queue up your Disney Plus. Uh, if you own the uh, Rogue One's on Disney Plus, if you own it on uh, Blu ray or iTunes or whatever, queue it up there. There's a timer on screen right now that shows the time code that where we're at, so you can fast forward to, to write the exact spot so that you can sync up with us again. Um, but there we go. That's the business. And let's get back to this great practical effects little guy in this battle sequence. I, I love that little guy. That's Warwick Davis. Yeah. Yeah. Star Wars legend. And this is all, uh, you would never guess it because that's the magic of Star Wars, but this is um, a set build on the back lot at, um, at Pinewood Studios. Classic um, screen, screenwriter, screenwriters will tell you this is what we call a save the cat moment. Sure. Uh, <laughs> where, they, where the hero does something sympathetic, uh, risks their life to save an innocent so that we so that yep. we like that character. Otherwise, you might not like Jim. Otherwise, you might not right. like Jim. <laughs> yeah. I cool. hadn't liked her at all up until that point. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, the sad that, thing that, is that, that that kid presumably ties him. Yeah, I mean, she, she, saved, she right. saved her life for like, what, two hours, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> But this is this is this is a great battle, and 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 the um, the kind of the kinetic, you know, very again. This is kind of what we wanted to go for. Was something a bit. It's still Star Wars. It's still being put out by Disney. But we wanted we wanted this war to look like a proper war, and this yes. really looks like something that might you know you might see happen you know in uh, Gaza or the West Bank or something. Right. And that's a terrible reference to make, but like we is we wanted people to feel like this was a real war a real a real insurgency and uh, it wasn't just about stormtroopers kind of hassling you know the the guy on the street corner but like there were there were there was real um this you know a, real lives at stake every day a, a very street level battle. yeah street, 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 street level is a great way to put it um i had another question but it, it's gone because this action sequence is that good stormtroopers missing their targets as always fortunately but this, I mean, they're just beaut beautifully shot, beautifully photographed. The uh, the, the choreography, of this action, and here's Jan getting, uh, you know, getting a little, uh, a little, a little close quarter of combat here. And the first, the first moment I think that Cassian really realizes that that Jan is uh, no one to be messed with. This is a good joke. That's, yeah, and this, this is, is a, I don't know who came up with that, gag. but that's a terrific gag. Yeah, that's not me. Um... It's probably me. <laughs> so, I'm guessing that was Tony, but I gotta give him credit. That's a great gag. In terms of uh, in terms of the action, how how much of the how specific did you guys get in your scripts about some of the action sequences? I mean, I mean, speaking just for me, I when I when I write action in generally, I try to choreograph too much because I that's not my thing. I, I when you're writing, the the only thing that you need to make sure that you write well is like what the, what that action scene means for the story and for the characters. Characters. Mm -hmm. Action can't just be shooty shooty for the sake of it. It's got to reveal character. It's got to advance story. You want to make sure you hit those moments in the scripts. But in terms of like, and then Jin has an uppercut and she pulls this out and does this, and you know, like that that kind of specific choreography at some point is going to be handled by people who do that for a living. And yeah, so I'm and happy to just wait for those guys to come in and make it look good. 
Absolutely. I mean, I usually put in enough to um, to pretend that I'm not half-assing it and trying to get away with uh, <laughs> just saying an amazing action sequence happens. Um, and then the best you know, car chase you know, you've ever seen. You know that somebody else who does this for a living uh, is going to come in and actually turn it into, uh, you know, stunts and, and what's going to be necessary for the CG. Now, so, Chira Imwe here, uh, who's another Chris White's creation, the amazing Donnie Yen. A lot of people think I, I got a lot of grief for me. Another I am with the force. Didn't you do that already in the Book of Eli? Look at me. That was Chris. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I, would, I would not pull the same trick twice. But I'm very glad um, Chris did because I think this th he's, he's a terrific character. Well, Gareth sort of ordered up a Zatoe type um, right. guy, um, and I had been uh, messing around with uh, with Gareth about a, a sort of a Force priest. So they became right. basically the same the same guy, um, and uh, and actually there's there's there uh, we also came up with this kind of counterpart to um, Chirrut, who was uh, Bayes Malbus. Who originally was a a murderer and and criminal, and and uh, Chirrut was kind of his father confessor figure, and they had a weird symbiotic, possibly codependent relationship, in which um, you know uh, Malbus would commit the crimes and Chirrut would would uh, forgive him for it. Right. Um, but uh, in in this film, they are both guardians of the wills. They're sort of uh... you still get a sense of that, Donna. They're they're a great mismatched buddy pair, right? Mm -hmm. One yeah. and, uh, and that Donnie Yen fight choreography was was incredible. And and when Bayes kind of saves him at the end there with that that um, heavy weapons barrage, it almost reminds me a little bit of uh, Indiana Jones shooting the guy in the market. You know, the guy with the sword. Yeah, I mean that's uh, like to your point about uh, getting across the the right character beats in an action sequence. Like that that shows their dynamic really, really cool and really quickly. Shoot, shoot. Oh, and, and speaking of, of character names, Malbus was the was my uh, half elven tenth eleventh level fighter magic user <laughs> in D and D when I was about eleven. So, hey, uh, you know, we coming perfect. up, you get coming some up with names track. for Star Wars characters is really hard. You don't know name that belongs in the Star Wars universe or it doesn't. And there's no rules for it. You just know it when you hear it. Right. And it's really hard to come up with good names for Star Wars characters. Right. It's it's not like, you know, with Tolkien where there's an entire fleshed out Elven language and everything makes sense according to the grammar and vocabulary of that language. Right. You know, when George Lucas was coming up with these things, he just liked the sound of certain things. Like, yeah. you can hear the name Wookiee in THX um, 1168, 1038. Um, just in a sort of passing bit of dialogue, and then it became uh, the name of, uh, of an entire species. Um, so yeah, it's kind of fun to try. It. And and like with everything, you sort of something is either Star Warsy or not. You kind of know it. Um, yeah, you, just, you just know it when you hear it. Sort of a follow up question to how you write action sequences. How how deep do you go for like the weird background aliens? You've got sort of known quantities like Saw Gerrera, but you've got you know, a Drio two tubes here mm -hmm. and like people who get all these weird backstories. Do you get, do you put any of that in there? Or is that all story group kind of fleshing? No, that's well, the, the, the amazing thing about you, even something with the strict to canon as, as star Wars is that you actually, I mean, I, I found, I think Gary did too, that you actually have quite a lot of freedom to come up with new stuff. You did. And so long as it doesn't um, grossly violate um, what's canonical. And you've always got Pablo Hidalgo to, to talk to and run things by. Um, it's you know you're you're in pretty good shape. So I actually think Two Tubes was uh, Tony Gilroy or maybe somebody uh, just before him. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's the so there's such joy in being able to make up these new species and characters. There's so many great little details in every scene. I don't know how many people ever really pick up on it, but the um, the, the the guys here in Saw's Hideout are playing like an, an old wooden version of Dejaric, the Star Wars chess game. Like not no holographic characters, just like original wooden pieces and things like that. I just think are really really cool. That's like and that guy is, Doug Chang. Uh, Bib Fortuna's cousin is canonically in this scene. I don't know if that right. was something you planned for, but there's... I think, there's a lot, a, I think a lot of that stuff gets added later when they actually get down to the nitty-gritty. And some of it's like day, like someone has a bright idea on the day. Uh, but when you're, when, you're, when you're just doing like the, the, the actual you know, broad strokes of the story, you, again, you don't want to just geek out and go, oh, what about this cool little character? Like, if it's not important to the story, it's not something you have to worry about today. And, and, the, and the little details and the cool um, you know, weird alien here or there or whatever, that's stuff that I think gets added much later in the process 
um, once the kind of the rubber really hits the road of, sh of shooting the stands. I, I did get shot down once by Pablo because I wanted a, a Tuscan Raider to have gone off Tatooine and joined uh, sort of guerrilla rebellion forces and right. said, no, they don't, they don't leave. One of, yeah, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the things that Lucasfilm really wants you to avoid is what they call the problem, where they don't want the same characters bumping into each other all the time just for the sake of like, oh, look, it's that guy, look, it's that guy. In uh -huh. a very, very early, we never wrote this, but in a very, very early, I I wrote um, uh, a scene where uh, Jin had to go barter for information uh, from one of the huts, not from Jabba, but like another hut who lived on like a big floating space barge. Um, and they're feeling, and, and, and again, the advice you would get back from Lucasfilm is like, don't, we've already seen that. Do something new. Do something like, do create something we haven't seen before and grow the universe. Um, and I think that was always great advice. And because you don't want every, you don't want every Star Wars movie to just feel like a remix of your greatest hits. It's, it's, there's, there's a recipe of like just enough of the familiarity to make you feel like, yeah, this is Star Wars, but at the same time, you want to say something new. And speaking about uh, developing uh, new things for the universe, uh, we actually have another question from IGN's YouTube channel, uh, user Fardog. Uh, can they speak? Of, can you guys speak about the development of the Guardians of the Wills, and if there was talk about what the actual wills are? I've always been interested in Lucas's wills ideas. Yeah. So, well, um, when uh, in, in uh, Gary will have his own thing to say, but I. I expect, but but when I came on board, I thought, well, I want to go into some deep George Lucas stuff, um, and so I looked at the original um, uh, screenplay of Star Wars, uh, which is pretty cuckoo bananas, like in terms yeah, of its ideas, right? right? There's some amazing things in it, right? But it's like unfilmable. It is gigantic. It is like just kind of shaggy, and so. Um, I was like, oh, I'm going to take some things from here because uh, there's so many cool things in it. Uh, you know, like Starkiller. And, and you can see that happening in, in other movies uh, in the Star Wars kind of like Starkiller base. Originally, originally Luke was Luke Starkiller, right? Um, and, uh, and so the Wills, there was a book, the Book of the Wills was originally the sort of the, the, uh, the great Bible tome that all of these movies were adaptations of, right? Um, so uh, I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, I'm gonna, Wills has a good sound to it, and and I, I like the idea of these people who are sort of keeping an old faith alive. So we're we're gonna we're gonna go there. Um, now I, I believe uh, that there's also a notion of the Wills uh, somehow connected to midichlorians that I don't fully understand. I, I confess uh, the the metaphysics of it all. Um, but I was just kind of doing some magpie uh, poaching from from deep old stuff, and like actually. Sure, it doesn't say this, but originally the force was known as was called the force of others in uh, by uh, by Lucas, um, and I had Chirrut often referring to the force of others rather than the force. Um, and and again, those, those are really really deep cuts that only the hardcore fans. But it's nice to have those those super deep cuts. <laughs> so this is uh, again this originally happened on. Well, this was a different planet, but this is this is uh, something that remains from my original script, where they've located Saw Gerrera's base. They know that Jyn Erso and the rebels are there, and uh, they right. want to destroy it. And they and and Krennic uh, uh, recognizes that this is an opportunity to test uh, the Death Star. And where this came from was again, John Noel said to me, "I want to see things that have never been seen in Star Wars before." And one of my first big ideas was, "Well, what what would what, here's something I want to see? What would it look like?" Uh, to to be uh, to be at ground zero when you get hit a planet gets hit by the Death Star. Mm. Now we know that if you're an Alderaan, it doesn't look like very much at all. One minute you're alive, the next second you're dead. Um, so we played around with this idea of they need to test the Death Star. They don't want to blow up the whole planet. Uh, you know, when you test a major weapon system for the first time, you don't test it 100% power. You test it at 10%. So and all they need to do is destroy the city. And from that came the idea that while well, we can actually do this amazing scene where we see, you know, the cataclysmic destruction of, again, when you see Alderaan destroyed, it's almost kind of an abstract thing. You don't really feel, Obi-Wan does, but you don't feel the deaths of like 5 billion people. So what does it look like to actually, to actually be at the same level as the poor bastards on the ground as it's getting hit by this, by this mega weapon from space? Um, and I pitched Gareth this idea of the U-Wing uh, escaping Saw's base 
literally as the Death Star is causing so much devastation that entire pieces of topography and mountain ranges are kind of folding over in on one another and the U-Wing has to kind of chart a course out. Um, and all of that ended up in the movie because I think Gareth would always liked the idea of like a, a spectacular sequence mm. like that, ex ex basically es escaping a Death Star black. Yeah, that's cool. Um, there was, of course, like some really fancy footwork we had to do at one point when uh, Star's moon was going to be destroyed. Um, you know, the notion that the first time you see the Death Star destroy a planet is in, is in episode right. four, right? right. So uh, for a while it was called a moon and that was kind of the loophole. Right. Um, and then it was sort of decided that, and, and, and uh, I, was wor I was worried at one point that if you have the Death Star that doesn't blow up a planet, is it make it somehow less cool? <laughs> right. um, but uh, yeah. but I destroying mean, there, Jedi was the way you arrived at that. There, there are so many things that going back through the A New Hope frame by frame did system star briefing room when the guy says you have not conjured up the stolen data tapes i'm writing okay they've got to be physical tapes it has to be right. physical objects which is great because you want to have that kind of macguffin in the third act anyway but then also the, there's very much the sense uh in um uh, peter, peter cushing says it in a new hope uh that when they destroy Alderaan, that's the first time the death star has fully been tested to destroy a planet and so but we wanted to see the death star do something um and so we came up with this idea that it would be this this you know ten percent power single reactor ignition whatever you want to call it um, uh, you know just a, just a you know, kind of hot looking at a, a smaller test uh, that didn't that didn't uh, canonically uh, conflict with the idea that Alderaan was the first planet the Death Star destroyed but we still get to see the Death Star do its thing. This is some nice stuff, Gary. I think this was you originally. It may have been transmogrified. This, I mean, this got heavily rewritten, stuff. but the one thing that survived, which is contribution to this movie is the idea that the flaw in the Death Star was not an accident. It was not an imperial oversight. It was an act of rebellion. It was an act of defiance that poor Mads Mikkelsen here had been forced to build this terrible weapon that he never wanted to build. And so because he's smarter than any of these other bastards, the one thing that he's done is built a back door into the design um, of the Death Star that the Empire don't see because he's smart. Again, his engineering skills are superior to him, so he can build in a floor that no one else spots. It passes all the inspections because he's a genius. Uh, but he knows that if it's there and he can get the information out to the Rebellion, they actually have a fighting chance to destroy this thing. So I, I, I basically got sick of everyone on the internet going, well, if the Empire is so smart, how come they built a massive floor <laughs> in the Death Star? I was like, okay, I'll show you how that happened. This, and this is actually... I really, I really uh, love the fact that ultimately that it wasn't, again, it wasn't an accident. Like it's there for a reason. And I think any time in storytelling you can make something happen for a reason, then you're on the right track. It's actually, there's somebody watching on uh, IGN.com right now, TK44216 had the question, uh, what were the major plot questions from A New Hope that you wanted to answer in this movie? Which that seems to be one well, of them. Well, that was certainly one of them. Where, yeah, did, the, uh, where did the exhaust? That is one of the best. Uh, Gary, you may not know this. Gusted afterwards, but there was a point where John Knoll, who was of course you know a software engineer and um, and kind of gearhead, very very technically um, sort of savvy, was like, look, uh, like a project the size of the Death Star, there would be hundreds of flaws that could um, possibly <laughs> bring down the station. I remember right? having that conversation with John as well, John. Correct. <laughs> well, I we were still having it when I was there. And I, it makes John... it makes it makes sense. It makes sense that there would be a flaw. I said yes, it does, but it's more interesting if the floor was put there deliberately and i'm, and I'm glad that that argument ultimately won <laughs> yeah well as i like, you know star wars amongst other things is also a a fairy tale right i mean uh, that, that's part of its deep deep strength and right. there is only one key that the lock fits in, in a fairy tale or maybe three but i've never i've never had much time for that level of nerdery with star i don't care I, I could honestly could not care less about things like that. It's it's fun to think about and make memes of, but it's not something that we think about when we're actually making these movies. Well, yeah, you know, and I remember asking Pablo at one point, like, how fast does a star destroyer go? Like, how fast does is, is travel through hyperspace? And he said, well, it, you know, we say star destroyers go at the speed of narrative, right? right. Which is like <laughs> whatever serves the story. Right. The, and way, obviously the, way, the, the way I heard it was hyperspace moves at the speed of plot, which is how, uh, how it, whatever is the most dramatically interesting it takes to get from somewhere to somewhere else, that's how long it takes. Right. Sure. And story you always of, wins. You try to hide those um, bits, the, those kind of uh, shoots There's and ladders. tremendous that amount of nerd, nerdy tech stuff that goes into these movies. But at the end of the day, and this is not just true of Star Wars, but anytime you do a sci-fi movie, if it comes down to a, if, if, if nerdy tech stuff and scientific reality 
can can coexist with storytelling, great. But if they come into conflict, storytelling always has to win. And again, this is the stuff that blew me away because this is what I imagined. Would, again, a Death Star right. blast, you know, basically creating this absolutely kind of cataclysmic geologic event and then racing back to the... Um, in, in the original one, it was a stolen Imperial shuttle because in my version, they had already stolen the Imperial shuttle at this point. In the late, in, in, um, in, in later versions, they stole it later. But So in, in, in my version, this was an Imperial shuttle they were escaping in. Uh, in this version, it's the U-Wing. But the, but the idea is basically the same. We've got to get the hell out of here because the planet is collapsing around us. And it's an incredible scene the way they shot it. I do love, yeah, I do love the, the little thing about them having to run towards the, right, the, the destruction. Of, or, right. Yeah. And here comes they this, this run towards tidal wave of destruction. Yeah. I mean, look at this. And what's great about this is it's also important that Jin and the other rebels saw up close what this thing could do. Like, it's not a blueprint. It's not an abstract. It's not a theory. They have now witnessed the terrifying destruction, uh, the terrifying destructive power of this weapon uh, firsthand. And so they now know better than anyone how important it is that they stop this thing. Beautifully shot. Yeah, fabulous stuff. And there, there goes Saw. And we there goes right. Saw. <laughs> We've and talked that was about how, that. And that was always how Saw died. He died. He just stood there and, and saw it coming and couldn't yeah. do anything about it. It was just on a different uh, on a different moon. Right. Right. Yeah. Different Look at this. Day, I love it. It's like there's like a whole piece, a whole massive like chunk of land, and then now the ceiling that is coming down on top of them, and then they hyperspaced out just in time. Oof. Beautiful. Look at that. Now I know Saw, Saw is is long gone at this point, but I had a I had a little question about that. A lot of people have drawn parallels between sort of his first reveal with Bodhi Rook having the bag on his head and Saw doing the questioning to uh, the Crying Game. Forrest Whitaker is in that position, but with roles <laughs> reversed. Yeah, uh, was that was that an intentional thing, or was that a did that just was that just sort of coincidence? Sorry, I asked the question again. I, I, I didn't quite the way you so passed. In, it, I didn't quite get it. When when Saw first pops up, he's he's questioning Bodhi Rook, and he's got him you know strapped to a chair with a bag on his head. Pretty much the premise for the Crying Game, where Forrest Whitaker is captured by the IRA. Uh, was that was that sort of an intentional nod to that, or is that that's close to the Chris's area? So you'd have to mm. ask him. I think that's more likely to be happenstance, but I think that that particular confrontation is Tony Gilroy territory. Um, what are the Sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, no, please. That's all I got. I was going to say, one of the, one of the, so one of the things that really developed a lot, so Krennic and Tarkin all kind of fractious relationship. They didn't like each other. But one of the things that got, um, that really got developed was, was the idea of this kind of power struggle over who was going to take credit for the Death Star. Krennic's the real architect of the Death Star. But Tarkin, like any smart bureaucrat, has realized that once once all the risk has been taken and this thing has been proven to work, Tarkin's going to now come in and take the credit. That was stuff that I think I think Chris was the first to really explore that in depth. And there was there was even a version. I, I came up with the idea that Krennic's the like you never see Imperial officers carry sidearms. Krennic does, uh, but he never did mm. anything with it. I think um, at one point in a, I think we actually shot this scene at one point. Krennic literally pulls that weapon on Tarkin, yeah. um, and 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 uh, I think it was Chris that really introduced the idea of like Tarkin coming in and basically stealing credit uh, for, for Krennic's work. And I think Tony kind of refined it from there. Am yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, right? yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you, uh, one tends to sort of think that, oh, Tar Tarkin in this version is going to be the same as Tarkin in the next one. But like th there was the possibility of seeing that, oh, I see he, he sort of, you know, he, uh, he increased his status by taking credit for this thing. That right. he uh, that he had been doubting all along. Yeah, and, that and it works, right? Yeah. Because by the time a new hope comes about Frank, he's yeah, he's, he's all forgotten. about it. History has uh, forgotten him. History is uh, written by the winners. Completely, like there's there, there's really you know it's it's a tragedy for Krennic as well that he uh, he gets written out. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know there was I, w I wish it had been true. When you go to the Death Star scene, the conference room scene, there's more than one empty chair. I wish there had just been one, because then I could have come up with the idea that that was that yeah. when Krennic had sat, but like he's, now he's kind of the missing man. So yeah, at this point they kind of realized you know just how bad things are. The Empire really again. One of the things that I that I still retains here is the is, is the rebellion is the is the rebels and the, then then the wider rebellion waking up to the idea that the Empire has finally done something so terrible that. Um, they have to. They they now have to go to the next level. If you remember, um, in the opening crawl, which was obviously was canon for us, 
it mentions that the the Battle of um, uh, Scarif was the first was kind of was was the first battle in the war. So everything you see in Star Wars Rebels, everything you see here, kind of predates there being a uh, a state of open war. And there's this idea that Mon Mothma and the other generals really are desperately trying to, by by any means, avoid um, a war and are trying to find some political solution to this crisis where the Empire is grabbing up more and more power. And Palpatine, of course, is kind of stringing them along because uh, all he's doing is he just, he, all he needs is to string them along long enough for that weapon to be ready. And then it's game over. And so the idea is that the rebels, I think, have been a little, have been kind of strung along and kind of played for fools by Palpatine a little bit because they're so desperate to find a diplomatic solution that would avoid the necessity of a full-scale war. But once once we realize that, that, that the Empire has essentially built a genocide weapon and what their real plans really are, and you see it even in the final version of the film, the rebels finally wake up to the idea that, yeah, the, the, the only solution now is war. The Empire is forced out of hand. And I like the idea that this, this movie is to some extent about the idea that, you know, Tyr tyrannical regimes always ultimately fall because they go too far. They get too hungry for power. They eventually do something so terrible that people who are up until that point who have acquiesced are now forced to, to stand up and fight back. And I feel like that was, if the Death Star had never built, sorry, if the, if the Empire had never built the Death Star, I think they probably could have just ultimately won the war and ground the, the, rebe the rebellion down just through attrition. Uh, but because they got greedy and built this insane weapon, they forced the entire galaxy to wake up and, and take that war seriously and, and prosecute the war against the Empire in a, in a much more uh, concerted way. So I, I kind of like that theory that the Death Star was really the Empire's undoing. In the yeah, I like that too. Um, yeah, and, and the, the sort of the, re the rebellion at this point is the, the equivalent of er early in the revolution, the Continental Congress, who could never get their act together. Right. They're dithering. It's a lot um, of squabbling factions. Yeah, and the the empire is able to, um, to to win because they are they're sort of authoritarian, unified, um, kind of top down. So yeah, now real, we go to Edu. Real, real quick, planet check. Who's whose planet is Edu? This me. is Gary's planet. This is me. Um, yeah. But 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 I think for both of us, it was originally in the first act, and here we are in the second it was, act. And it got moved. So the whole movie kind of got restructured a little bit after. They went. Big deflector dish. Not the yeah, hey, Gary. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you real quick, but uh, I, you cut out just a little bit. Um, okay. At so, the start of that. so Edu was originally. They went to this planet very early in my. I was actually building the laser array, the massive dish, and then have when it was built, it was shipped to the Death Star construction site, and that was the first hint that that Jin had that the Empire were building something terrible. As the movie kind of got you know jiggled around and restructured, it got pushed back. Um, and became less a uh, less the place where the dish was built, and more just where they were where they were um, harvesting and refining the, the the kyber crystals that are the energy source uh, for the um, uh, for the for the Death Star. But this planet, this very kind of this rainy kind of windswept, very grim planet where the Empire have this kind of a this kind of cliff top platform, uh, does come from my um, original draft. And then, uh, I think later on, you know, the idea of a rebel X-wing attack on the, on, on the, um, originally I, there was a version where it was, wasn't it, don't, don't you remember, Chris, it was like saws, it was actually saws, gorilla X-wings that attacks this planet. Yes. We had all saws, kinds of different versions of it. Gorilla X-wings, not the rebel X-wings. Um, indeed it was. Um, and let me see. I remember, I remember seeing a saw gorilla X-wing that was actually painted in like tiger stripe camo. It looked amazing. Yeah. It was like dazzle oh, cool. camouflage. It was great. Um, fabulous stuff. A uh, <laughs> lot of rain in this uh, Star Wars movie, right? Rain, we had it. Rain equals nice. mood. Rain equals mood. Uh, uh, so hard to shoot in rain. My there God. was originally a longer version of this where Jin and a little native village, these people called the Idawai who live in Idu, and they told a story about how the about this about this imperial facility had poisoned and toxified all their uh, rivers and and valleys and farmland because of all the toxins that this refinery was putting um, into the uh, into the into the atmosphere and into the local uh, uh, geography. And again, try, always trying to kind of put a human face on the crimes that the empire are committing. Like here's here's like these poor villagers who are suffering because the empire built this incredible um, uh, you know horrible toxic facility right in their neighborhood. Again, at the end of the, it's a, a nice scene, a nice idea, but at the end of the day, the movie didn't need it, so it went. And how much is stuff like that in early drafts of the script uh, went into Mads Mikkelsen thinking he was a bad guy? 
Like, because he's, you'd ha- now you'd, he's, you'd, now you'd, he's, you'd have to, you'd have to ask Mads. Again, yeah, Mads that's, thinks of killed. Well, Gary, I'm sorry, we lost you again, I think. I was going to say, you know, I think Mads, again, when I last spoke to Mads about this, he really does see his character as a villain. He doesn't feel the, 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 the exhaust port and the fact that he tries to undo his terrible wrongs. I think in Mads' mind, that doesn't um, absolve him of, of the fact that he did build this thing. Um, and he and, and even though there is this kind of redemptive act at the end, I, lo- I love shots like this. Look at this. I'm sorry, but that's so cool. Yeah, it's fabulous. It just, I mean, it looks like a real airbase when you see this stuff. And um, so, you know, G- Gareth was a was a CGI uh, guy uh, yeah. before he was a director, and and he did he did the effects for his first movie, Monster, which have which has the most amazing effects. But he knows how to uh, use these things and how to kind of fit them in a in a uh, glimpsed way, right? It just rather looks so than, real. Yeah. You know, and he and he shoots a lot of stuff handheld, and that ha- gives you that kind of cinema verite documentarian kind of thing. Like, it doesn't look like a polished movie. I mean, it looks polished, but it look also looks like almost kind of like um like a like a combat uh, cor- like a combat cameraman filming that stuff, and it and it gives it a really grounded feel. So yeah, here on Edu, what you're going to see here again, a lot of the, even even later, the point of this scene is completely different. They're no longer here to investigate what this, um, what, the, what, what the, the Empire are building here. They're, they've gone here to try and find Mads. Um, but a lot of the specifics of the scene uh, remain the same. This whole business you're about to see here with Jin kind of climbing up on this platform, taking out the Imperial soldiers, um, and you know, there, there basically being a lot of kind of action uh, business here um, is is again all retained from the you know the very earlier versions of the script. And the, and 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 again and also the. And also the and also the element of um, uh, uh, Krennic coming to fit. This was a big, I guess it was a big surprise in my version in the early script, and it remains a big surprise now. That right, and why is they're in the middle of doing this? It's like, oh shit, here comes this Imperial shuttle. Krennic's come to visit. In my version, Krennic had come to kind of ins- like go kind of uh, conduct like a final inspection of the dish that they were building here. And in in this scene, obviously, it's, it's to confront um, uh, um, Galen about who's the who's the traitor. But, a lot, but again, a lot of the mechanics of the scene remain the same. This is also a big moment for Cassian's character here. I mean, in, in, in talking about Cassian's arc from, you know, starting at the first time we meet him, he's killing one of his own informants uh, or one of his own guys. Um, he's got these orders to kill uh, Galen or so on site without question. Um, and then here we start to see sort of the uh, him, him sort of, obviously he doesn't end up killing him but like talking talk about the, the galen's arc in general uh and what that was like to to sort of work with other writers to, uh, to about, make sure. about cassian's arc um, cassian's arc yeah i'm sorry yeah well he was always uh meant to be compromised um you know i think in in gary and my versions um he was severely compromised he was a say, double for, agent for a long time he was working for the for the empire um and my, I think this was a rationale that I added in, was that um, he had lost people who had been killed by Saw Gerrera, uh, and all he wanted from the Empire was the go-ahead and the ability to kill Saw Gerrera, rather than Galen Ursa. Um, and that kind of transmogrified along the lines to uh, uh, post me and Gary into a, uh, a, a rebel uh, intelligence officer who had done terrible things and here chooses chooses not to. Yeah, in, a, in, like, in the very very version, very very version of very very early version of his name, he was Cassie at this point. Um, he was in fact kind of he, he was a rebel soldier who was secretly working uh, for Krennic. But then he, but then as he as he grew closer to Jin and realized that the Empire had built this weapon, he's like, I never signed up for this. I didn't sign up for killing planets. Um, he, he, you know, has a change of heart and, and flips to the rebel side, but that's after he's exposed as a spy. And at that point in the third act, he kind of has to win, uh, Jin's, uh, trust back. That was all fun. That was all interesting. I think they actually shot some of that stuff early on, but I think the, I think the, this version ended up being kind of more nuanced and more interesting.
and like like here right here is like kind of Cassian's internal conflict playing out. Yeah. And, or, and, you know, all for nothing, as it turns out. Krennic is such a great bad guy. I, I also love the fact that, that Krennic's very vain. The fact that white version of the Imperial uniform, but he's decided to, to give that to himself and the cape. Like, it's all very... It's all, the these, all, these, all these affectations. I think that was a Wilhelm scream, wasn't it? Um, just to call Might that have been. Yeah. You gotta have one. Just one. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm here. You better work Yeah, this is a great, this is a great, great piece of action here. And again, the, and again, the one thing that they... no, 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 no. Uh, was the Rebel X-wing attack that, like, really, really, you, got, you, know, you think about, it, you've got so many uh, factors here. You know, you've got you've got good guys on the ground, but again, the Rebels are always, you know, the Rebel Command are always thinking about, well, like, what's what, what what's the big picture? We may we may have to blow up a few of our own guys in order to uh, prevent. Uh, you know, a much worse situation uh, from developing. So, you know, you've got rebel uh, X-Wings here who are going to bomb this um, this facility, even though they know uh, that uh, there may be um, rebels on the ground. I think at this point, that's what, this is when they're learning that and they're trying to get the, get the X-Wings back. Um, but at this point, they've, they've already committed to the, to the, to the air raid. I mean, this is some good World War II movie kind of stuff, right? In, in, in as much as uh, and George that, Lucas. And you remember this, Chris. I mean, that was the original... Oh. A mission move. Uh, Gary, in, Gary, we lost Lord you for... We lost you for a chunk of that one again. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I don't know why that's happening. Well, I, lowered, I lowered my gain knob quite a bit. Um, uh, that, that was originally what John Knob wanted. Like, when he showed me his reference book of, of everything he used to originally pitch the movie, it was all things like... Uh, the guns and have our own and the dirty dozen and doing a good mm -hmm. old-fashioned men on a mission uh movie I, I one of my big reference points was uh i don't know if you've ever seen a great old movie called where evil's dare with clint eastwood mm -hmm. and richard burton where they have to dress up as nazi officers and infiltrate you know the the nazi castle up in the bavarian alps all the stuff where they put on the imperial uniforms and infiltrate scarif as imperial officers is all directly influenced from movies like that where you'd have all, all these great actors from the 60s and 70s dressing up like nazis to infiltrate uh you know nazi uh nazi bases There's a, a wonderful moment with Chiru coming up here where he, I don't think I missed it. I don't think we missed it. I think it's still coming up where he shoots down one of the fighters. Oh, which, with the, yeah, he does it blind. With the, yeah. 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 And again, is the force guiding him? Who knows? Maybe. And that's, and that's one of the things like he's one of the, yeah, here. It, this, is, this, is, this is a great little shot. Right. And not only does he shoot the TIE fighter down, but then the TIE fighter proceeds to crash right. into the base. <laughs> it's just... He's pretty it's, good. It's, um, yeah, he's so cool. Yeah. But Donnie and you did some great business around it too, like blowing on his hand in that kind of right. weird way, right. clenching his fist. He's, he's right. just so great at that. And, you know, Krennic, Krennic having to, you know, go to the shuttle and part you do under fire all of this stuff um is, is stuff that was in the movie from the very beginning and again just kind of recontextualized <coughs> excuse me and now what originally happened here was Jin, Jin, you know, Krennic, uh, uh, galen was mortally wounded um Jin gets him off the planet actually gets him back to the rebel base but he's beyond saving and this whole little speech where he says you know you've got to destroy the death star you know i've, I've done all i can now you know kind of now it falls to you to finish the work that i've started um, this scene originally played out in kind of like a rebel, uh, like a rebel base medical bay, like, and she was at his bedside again, more, I think more dramatic to do it here, you know, amidst all the, amidst all this destruction, but the idea of, of the father kind of slipping away in her arms. And, and as he, like he's, he's dying wishes, like finish what I've started again, that was something that was baked into the DNA of the story from, from very early on. I will say this line the last thing that he says to his daughter is, I have so much to tell you, right. which I find to be the most heartbreaking. Because you'll never hear any of it. Yeah, yeah. As, as, a, as a parent, that line just, just really, really got me. Yeah. Yeah. My, my daughter was about three years old when I was working on this. Uh, I was still filled with all of the joy and confusion and despair of being a right. relatively new parent. And you channel all that stuff into, these, into, into your work. 
But yeah, and also to your point about having to leave him behind amid all this destruction. Right. She too, doesn't even get to bring really, him to the body. Right. Out. Yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah. Again, and, and it's all you know, spaceship. But movies live and live and die on on the emotional uh, resonance of, of scenes like that. Maz is great. What a face. Yeah. Um, and by the way, there was one point at which we were kicking around titles for this, right? Rogue One was was a good choice eventually, but but one of them was Dark Times. Uh, we had we had a lot at one at one point. Um, John Swartz, uh, who is one of the one of the creative ex film, um, uh, had a list, and we all kind of voted on the ones that we like. I contributed two. Um, and uh, it was always it was always popular. People liked it. Where we missed it. Oh, we missed it. Yeah. What was it? The... I didn't tell you the other one. Uh, I, 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 I went like Shadow of the Death Star. All these kind of very fancy titles. One of the things that occurred to me was I went back and looked at all the previous films, and all of and this is actually it continues to be true even after even with the sequel trilogy now being completed. The titles of Star Wars saga films are always either three words or four words long. They just all are. Um, and so it occurred to me that one of the ways that we could differentiate th this movie from the rest is we had a title that was only one word or two words long. So like Star Wars Rebellion, Star Wars Rogue One, um, you know, things like that. I, 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 let's, let's, do a, let's do a title that's shorter. So right away, even from the title of the movie, you know this is something that doesn't necessarily um, conform to the unwritten rules of the saga films. And I'm, I'm glad they were. It's a great title. I, 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 if I, even if I say so um, myself, I, I'm re really, really, ha really glad that it's stuck. And they don't tell you these things again. When they announced the title, that's how I found out when Bob announced shareholders conference, they went, Oh, that's my title. How, yeah, how you, nice. But like, that, you that's find how out I found the same out. time the shareholders did. Right, that's great. Right. Um, now we just, we, Going away from that dramatic scene there, uh, from Edu, there was a, a great swell in the score. Um, and it's, there's a question from uh, somebody watching on Cinefix, uh, user Gelatonio. Would you be able to talk about the score? And he says, one of the best out there. Um, how, I mean, obviously, you, you, when you're writing it, you don't write the score. But, um, you know, how how happy were you with the score for, for this film and, and the scenes that you did write? I've been listening to it a lot lately as Right. Um, and I think it's really beautiful. It's wonderful, um, especially the, the the track called "Your Father Would Be Proud," um, which which oh, yeah. Gorgeous. comes up in, towards the end of the, the film. Very end, yeah. Um, and uh, no, we have no inkling of what it's going to be because that's really all done in post production. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a just in time uh, uh, aspect to to the film. Um, but I I think it's I think it's great. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, I, I had no idea because again, that that falls well outside of our wheelhouse, well above our pay grade as writers. Uh, I know that Gareth originally um, wanted Alexandra Desplat, who uh, worked on Godzilla with him and has done amazing work. I think that would have been great as well. For whatever reason, I don't know that didn't work out. Michael Giacchino, I think, actually came on relatively late. Um, and you know, I, 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 I'll admit, I was. The music is such a part of the Star Wars films. Like it just is. Like whenever I'm writing a movie, I always put together a little playlist of things um, that that put me in the mindset. And of course, with Star Wars, it was easy. I just listened to John Williams' soundtrack. And I think what Michael yeah. did in the end was like brilliantly just kind of riff on. And you'll and you'll hear it here with me. Very like the Imperial March shows up here in in, in a different way uh, in the first time. And, and when and when the movie really segues into becoming a New Hope at the very end, you really do feel it. Michael brings in a lot of those classic themes. Um, but I, I think he did a great job of like giving the, the movie its own musical identity at the same time, like it feels like a Star Wars score. And this is probably my other favorite thing that I contributed to the movie. Like this is a Lego set. Like I can't believe that an idea that I came up with this film is a Lego set now. But like, my big thing was like, I want to see Vader again, always thinking about what John Knoll said, let's see something we haven't seen in Star Wars before. I was like, I want to see something. What does Vader go when he's not working? Like he's got to go somewhere. Like where's his crib? Like what does he do when he's when he's on, when he's on his day off? And Gareth loves 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 that scene in The Empire Strikes Back when you just get the glimpse of um, Back to Vader's head. Yeah, when the um, oh the, the other one yeah the comes down. And so I thought, well, let's let's try and let's take that and blow that out and do a more powerful version of it. And I really liked the idea that the Vader is so physically ruined and so destroyed and so damaged that every now and again he has to completely take off all the armor. 
and take what's left of his body and put it in this back to tank to kind of heal and regenerate, you know, maybe one day every month or however, however, no, but he's it's something he has to do from time to time. And I love the idea of seeing him almost like a fetus in a jar because, mm. because it reminds us of just how little physically there is left of it. Like you, you, if you haven't, you, the last time we saw that was Revenge of the Sith, like his arms and legs are gone. There's almost nothing left under that suit. He's a very imposing presence, but take that suit away. And there's just a torso. There's almost nothing left of, of, the, of the human man. And I wanted to kind of remind viewers of that. Um, and I thought it, it worked out really, really well. And again, the context here is a little bit different. Uh, you know, my originally the Krennic did was, was was brought to Mustafar to explain, you know, why he's failed to found the rebels. Uh, I think Tony ended up rewriting this and gave it a slightly different context. But I love the idea that Krennic is one of the probably the only Imperial officer other than Tarkin that will actually stand his ground. You know, all the Imperial officers are terrified of Vader. Yes, sir, no, sir. And they won't stand up to him because they know he'll just choke him to death. Krennic, I love the fact that he will actually push back. And so I'm going to hold on a minute. Like, he'll actually stand his ground. Um, and, al and almost seems at the end to have almost kind of a weird um, uh, sexual pleasure in being choked by Vader. I don't know if I'm reading too much into it. But <laughs> seems to kind of enjoy it a little bit too much. I don't know. He's like, oh, do that again. I don't know. Well, maybe there's something uh, among all the Imperial officers that you haven't really made it until you've been choked yeah. by Vader. So Listen, you don't, you don't really like, count. Yeah, it's like a, you know, it's like a merit badge. And then, the other, and then the other big idea here in the movie is like you know, there's oh, there's always this sound. You see it. Vader is conflict. You know, it's he's still deep down under there somewhere. Anakin Skywalker is still alive. And you see that at the end of Return of the Jedi because he comes back to life. And so I had this idea that like, when, where would Vader true, choose to build his personal home? Well, I love the idea that he built it on Mustafar, the place where Anakin Skywalker died and Darth Vader was born. That's a place that has a, a, it's a very, it has a very deep personal connection and meaning uh, to Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker. And I like the idea that he comes out here to reflect and stand on that balcony and literally look over out over that river of lava where he died and ask himself, what the hell happened to me? Like, what the hell happened to the man? Well, he knows, he like, you know, he needs to re-experience his trauma to psychologically yeah. get past it. Yeah, I think so. So here again is a, is a scene that was had, been, had recontextualized, um, you know, Jin, um, you know, now can, I've seen this thing, the Empire, I've got proof, they've built this terrible weapon. What are we going to do about it? And uh, there was always always this idea that again, the re the rebellion is not one monolithic entity. It's a it's a collection of worlds, uh, all of whom have their own leaders, uh, all of whom have their own opinions. And you know, Mon Mothma, this is this is not the Empire. That's the difference. You know, one of the reasons why the Empire does so well is is di dictatorships are very efficient. Palpatine says we're doing this, and everyone's doing it. Nobody questions him. And one of the reasons why the rebellion. I think has historically been less effective is it's more it's more democratic and and, dem and democracies are messy and it can be hard, sometimes harder to get things done uh, and you're seeing that play out here as the as the rebels are very undecided over um what to do in the in the face of you know this apocalyptic news that um the empire's built a weapon of mass destruction every time i see jimmy smith i'm happy <laughs> just every time Yeah, she's right. I mean, Alderaan's going to pay the price, huh? Right. Um, there was briefly, we toyed with, or maybe it was just me, <laughs> a, a Leia appearance. Uh, she's referred to, of course, when um, when Jimmy, when and, Jimmy uh, and, uh, takes uh, off and Mon chats with Mon Mothma. Um, but best, I think, for Jen to, to give the most rousing. Right, beach chair. Right. Leia, we toyed with various different ways to use Leia in the, oh. in the end. A decision was made to, to to use her like in a very sparing way at the very very end of the movie. Because again, you, you you can you can overdo it so easily with those iconic characters. I do love these war room scenes where everybody gets just totally dressed down. Right. Just. Because you come into the scene and there's so much, everybody's mad at each other and everybody's yelling and then the air just gets sucked out because, you know, she's right. Yeah, and again, again you can see here, like, democracies are messy and they're efficient. Reach a decision of so Jin's going to go have to take matters 
um, into our own hands. We will be. What is wrong? You know, so four of us is quite enough. How many do we need? What are you talking about? I think, you know, in all, um, all the Star Wars movies are in some way about family. Obviously, the saga film plainly, all of them to some extent are, you know, this is, this is a family, a found family. Um, of rebels and orphans and misfits who have kind of found each other, um, you know, all very different. But like the one thing that connects them is this common cause. They all want to destroy the empire. They all want to live 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 lives of of freedom and and peace and justice. And and uh, and so it's brought together people from all walks of life. Some of us, most of us, have all gone through this thing. This is a great moment. I think. Is this you, Chris? Um, no. Uh, well, I think that the spirit of it might. Be in the, in the sense that like these are a bunch of uh, severely compromised individuals, um, but that's that's from you too, is, uh, Gary. I, I think that the the dialogue maybe Tony Gilroy, it maybe um... the the big difference from uh, the version I wrote and originally did actually convince the rebels in the moment, and they all and they all went as part right. of the plan. Um, the big change that was made, and I think it's cool is that Jin now goes rogue, which makes total sense given the title of the movie. And only when Mon Mothma finds out that she's kind of committed to that, 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 that does she make the decision to back her up? And so it all comes together in a much more uh, improvised way. But in my original version of it, this was like, they all, they, you know, she convinced Mon Mothma that they needed to do this. Um, and and uh, Radis and all the other characters kind of got around a table and it's like, right, here's, here's the plan. And it was all part, it was all part of a concerted effort. Yeah, I think... I think it was in one of my drafts that they, yeah, they, they went off on their own. Um, hence the, the, so I think it was me that, that sort of uh, retconned your Rogue One idea into why they came up with it. It was just a sort of a, an improvisation. Yeah, well, um, I mean, so, you know, in, in my version, Jin's mission was and she was Rogue Leader. That was her call right. Rogue Leader. Um, and that was the uh, that was the, those were the two titles that I put in. One was Rogue Leader, one, and they picked Rogue One. This is the scene where I got cut right there. That's the scene. Uh, <laughs> but maybe that's you. She, no, that's, she's that's, walking out to the you. shuttle there. Of all uh, the things to get cut, that's the that's the tragedy. I can't. You probably, you'd probably show up in a short story Gareth, or something, Gareth, or like a novella. Gareth very, kind, very Gareth very kindly sent me a screen grab cut scene, so I, I have it for my personal collection. I'm not allowed to have a show. You version. should edit it into your personal version. Is, right? Yeah, is it in a frame back there? In the... um, yeah, so so I think I came up with this idea that they're vamping uh, to, to, they make up a, this kind of squadron that doesn't exist. And right. I had set it up earlier with these kind of grunts complaining about how all the flyboys make up these cool names for their squadrons. Like they're <laughs> making fun of like Gold Squadron, Lavender Squadron. Right. Um, so. Yeah, tough sounding a, guy squadron. Little, yeah, little, little, I haven't watched this movie really since it came out. But it's certainly not in a, as I'm looking at it now. It's really, like there was a there was a moment in this that I really liked, uh, and again, like the movie's no worse for not having it. But it was just an idea that I liked that you know K two had basically um, had, as he had become a rebel droid had scraped off all these imperial markings because he no longer identified with those markings and didn't want them on him. But in order to go on this mission, he had to have them repainted back on. So he looked like a proper Imperial droid. And he hated yeah. it. He didn't want those Imperial markings back on him. Cool. This scene here, um, other than the fact that this was originally Dodonna instead of talking to Bale, is probably the one scene from the movie that, ex that, that, that survived intact from my draft, word for word in terms of the dialogue that hmm. I wrote. Like this was almost untouched from my original um, uh, script of this scene. And it was a real thrill for me to see this play out as I um, as I had imagined it. And of course, the whole purpose of that scene, uh, again, is coming from a very nerdy place. If you play back Leia's, Leia's graphic message, she says, you know, General Kenobi, my, my mission to um, bring it to Alderaan has failed. Um, and what and, and what you're seeing there with Mon Mothma and Bail Organa is, is that mission being set up. That it's now, uh, war is inevitable. Uh, there's no more diplomacy. They're gonna need every advantage. Bail Organa happens to have an old friend, a Jedi Knight. Uh, in hiding, and so Mon Mothma is going to dispatch him uh, to bring him back to Alderaan, where he can help the rebels and advise the rebels. You know, a great hero of the Clone Wars can now help them uh, in this war ahead. Of course, that doesn't quite work out. 
And plus, anytime you can get Jimmy Smith to say words that he wrote, that's that's oh, a what a what a thrill. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, by the way, this this shuttle is SW0608, which is my twelve year old's uh, birthday and initials. Um, there, <laughs> there is speculation on the internet as to why it was called that. But that's uh, the reason. I, I didn't that's know what it that is. until now. I'm learning things. Yeah, well, and I was able to give him the tour. Uh, this, this was for you. Oh, and of course, great. he was like, "Thanks, Dad." Um, he did not cheer up, you know. It's like... So, um, Scarif is uh, this scene, uh, this whole uh, part of the movie again. Uh, a lot stayed the same. Uh, this is really where I went full on into overdrive, wanting to kind of homage and pay tribute to Return of the Jedi. You know, you've got, we got to get through the, sh you know, they've got to get through the shield. We're in a stolen Imperial shuttle. Let's hope the codes work. All that kind of stuff. Um, and then in a, in a and then in a larger context, like I again, people uh, like to hate on Return of the Jedi. I think it's a great movie, and I think the third act is is some of the best Star Wars that's ever been made. The way that it cuts back and forth between those three different battles that are taking place, the the, the battle uh, you know in, in orbit above Endor, the battle on the ground, and then the battle in the Emperor's throne room, and how they all interconnect, I think is just absolute storytelling and editing genius. And in Agreed. my own small way, I wanted to try to. Um, uh, pay homage or just blatantly steal how well that stuff worked when you've got the commando raid on the ground the rebel fleet in orbit and i wanted to make sure that we saw those because i love the mon calamari i wanted to make sure we saw those big mon calamari uh capital ships one of the reason one of the reasons why i believe the return of the jedi battle works so well is that those big ships give you a, a tremendous sense of scale and this and, and 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 relative speed at which the smaller fighters are moving when ships are flying uh, around in space if it's just on a black on a star field it's hard to kind of get a sense of relative speed but when they're skimming over the surface of a much larger ship not much larger cruiser you can feel how how fast those those ships are moving and so i wanted to make sure we have like the rebels at this point have committed everything because it's it's this if they don't win this battle it's all over um and so they have they commit everything the, the the capital ships the cruisers pretty much every ship they have uh to this battle uh and so it was a great opportunity to to get to see some of those uh the, 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 those big heavy ships that we love from uh return of the jedi so th this uh this battle um is really like structure gary um i mean i think you know i can mostly just just ride it in at this point, um, I think my twist on it was that I, I insisted everyone had to die. I think the right. I think the, the Gary had uh, had had thought about it, and uh, and yeah, perhaps the, the, con the when, concern when was that uh, it wouldn't be approved. And, I know. Um, and and let, 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 here's the moral. And anyone out there thinking about writing, you know, this is this is the lesson. That, um, Gareth and I talked about it. It was one of the very first conversations we had. I think it was Gareth that brought it up. I said, I think this is a movie. I think they all have to die. I think this is a movie about sacrifice and how this, when, it, when it's something this important, like these characters die so that the entire Star Wars franchise can live. If these characters don't do this over the next 20 minutes, the Star Wars movies are about the Death Star going around blowing up planets until the Empire, until the rebellion just gives up and surrenders. That's all. That's all you've got left. And so this is really, really important Star Wars history that we're seeing here. The characters recognize that it's it's perhaps fitting that they die. We we uh, we went back and looked at the ending of Gladiator. When Maximus dies. Uh, the, you know, the, the the idea that you can actually have a righteous death, you can you can be triumphant even in death because you've accomplished your great your greater your greater goal um, was something really important to us. And we but we but we thought, oh my God, Disney will never let us do it. That we will fall in love with this idea of killing off all the characters. Disney won't let us do it and when we'll have our hearts broken. So we didn't follow through on our initial creative instinct. Um, and uh, I wish we had, because it turned out that Disney and Kathy and all those guys were fully supportive of it. When I left the movie and Chris came on, the first thing he said was, I didn't feel like these characters needed to die. And Gareth went, oh yes, I'm so glad you said that because that's what Gary and I talked about. And we got there in the end, but like, I guess the moral is trust your instincts and like write the version of the movie that you believe, not the version that you believe people will say yes to. Because as it turned out, we would have been right. In my version, K2 always died, but Jin and the yeah. other characters survived. And that would have been, I think, a far inferior version of the film. I'm so glad that Chris came along and, and had that same instinct to kill the characters off because it ended up, I think, being, you know, some of the most powerful stuff in the film. Yeah, it's great. And this whole uh, scare of sequence the last 20 30 minutes of this movie I, I mean stack up with every I mean it's it's one of the best for my money the best 
Star Wars gets. I, I love this this last bit of this movie, and that's part of it. Yeah, and this and, and, and a lot of this stuff here, um, again, is is uh, from uh, early version stuff. That I, the sense that this is like a heist. You know, they they show up in the captured Imperial shuttle uh, with the commandos. Um, the the Imperial, you know, Jin and the the guys in the Imperial outfits and K two, who obviously is in an Imperial disguise, um, go off and do their thing while these Rebel commandos kind of disappear through the shuttle hatch here and kind of spread out. Uh, and this is all part of like an organized caper at this point. Like all, this this all has to now go off uh, like a Swiss watch, and um, it's something that that was very carefully uh, orchestrated uh, through every draft of the movie that we had. And talk about too. We've talked a lot about creating planets uh, for these movies and, and and creating new things for the Star Wars universe. Talk about the idea of just creating a planet, like the idea of like, oh, we need a tropical beach planet. I think um, at some point uh, that's that's like a, a question of the entire production and Gara thinking like, well, what what sort of uh, what sort of place hasn't been seen before? Um, and uh, but the, the the really tricky thing with making these places is like, how are you going to lay out the geography of this particular place in such a way that the characters have to do what they need them to do um, at the time that we need them to do it. So like, you always sort of end up with a walkway or, uh, right. you know, <laughs> that someone has to get to the end of because it's only one person who can get that, you know, like you're actually really building these places in order to fulfill the needs of, of the story. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And you know, it was it's challenging to Star Wars, like we've seen desert planets, we've seen ice planets, um, and you know, you do, again, you don't want to repeat yourself. This is um, Canary Wharf uh, 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 underground station in London. They shut this down for the night and shot this. They redressed it, shot it all overnight, and got out the next morning in time for the trains to run. Kind of amazing. Wow. Um, uh, but yeah, so like the, the idea of like a tropical beach, almost like a Vietnam kind of uh, Far East kind of planet, um, had never had never been uh, done, and it's obviously a great look. It's also a nice opportunity for the crew to go out and hang out on, on a beach uh, for a while. Some of this, some of this actually was shot out. I can't remember exactly what tropical place they went to, uh, but a lot of this was 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 actually shot in a place called Bovingdon, which is a very unglamorous part of England, where they just shipped in hundreds of tons of sand and built this stuff um, out in the middle of middle of nowhere. It was nowhere near an ocean, but they but they built this beach and then digitally extended uh, the scenes. Uh, as necessary. So I, again, I kind of love all this stuff like planning the thermal detonators and they're all timed to go off at just the right moment. The, again, the idea of kind of a, you know, a, a crack, crack, a jack timing uh, in a, you know, taking down the guards silently. This is all like classic tropey stuff from movies you've seen a hundred times, but when you see it in a Star Wars context, it's it's kind of cool, you know, and new. I love that. There, there's something I really do love about this because it totally is evocative of like the, um, you know, the surfing scene in Apocalypse and the palm mm -hmm. trees are immediately evocative of right. Vietnam stuff, which is weird because like Coppola came to Lucas in 1975 or something. It was like, hey, do you want to do a Vietnam movie with me? And Lucas, right. no, people need a fairy tale. Like we need to make something more magical. And then, you know, 40 years later, we've kind of gone full circle. And now there are Star Wars movies that are, you know, evoking classic Vietnam War movies, which is, right. yeah, it just shows how right. kind of timeless it is. Right. A lot of these extras that you see here are actually real soldiers, either ex-military or specific agencies that will that will hook you up with these guys because you don't need to train them how to handle a weapon or how to move like a real soldier. They're already trained uh, to do that. In fact, one of my favorite stories was when I, when I, when I was hanging out with the X-Wing pilots uh, on the Yavin base. I was talking to them. I said, so what do you guys do for a living? And um, I expected they say that like that they were they were extras or they had like you know, regular jobs. And one of the guys or a couple of them there said we're actually real life RAF tornado pilots. We fly. We're we're, we're the real deal. I was like, oh awesome. my god, this is crazy. Like you must. And and they looked like you know like they just had that kind of RAF kind of class pilots bearing. They they carry themselves in a certain way, like a military way. Like they never slouch. They always stand up straight. And I said, well, this I, I said, this must seem rather silly to you. Like you fly the real planes. This X wing over here, like, is just a you know a, a cardboard thing. Uh, and the guy said, no, no, you don't get it. Like this is this is actually the real thrill for me. The whole reason why I'm a pilot is because when I was a kid, I saw Star Wars and I dreamed of flying an X wing. So I became a, I became a pilot. So like this for me is actually the real dream. I'm I'm finally I finally got to do it. And that, that to me was just I think speaks so to the cool. power of, of Star That's Wars. Great. I would I would love to see a side by side of of the guys who are actually military trained playing stormtroopers and the five hundred first guys who just religiously study five hundred first <laughs> or like stormtrooper footage and 
Like right. who passes in a lineup as, as an actual stormtrooper? It's it's hard to fake this stuff again. You see it more on the Rebel Commando side. The way they speak, like you, you can you can tell when the, these guys have been have been you know properly trained. Yeah, I think it goes with what we were talking about earlier the uh, the action sequence on on Jeddah of just just having it feel like more of a uh, you know, more of a, a street I guess beach level battle. Um, the, the, just yeah, the way the guys move and. I think I love, I, I I love the energy that this other while. guy had. I was going to say, I, I, uh -huh. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I actually think Tarkin holds up pretty well. I remember <laughs> seeing that in theaters. It was immediately jarring. Um, it does look it does look really impressive, but it's also like, I think it's depending on how obsessively you've watched Peter Cushing play Tarkin. Right. You know, yeah. if you're yeah. if you're kind of a more casual viewer, you're probably like, hey, wow, that's cool. I know when people first saw it, they were kind of split. I don't know if you saw Chopper's. Mm -hmm. Chopper just rolled by from Star Wars Rebels. There's a lot of Rebels uh, cameos in this movie. There's a a reference to uh, General Sandula being asked to report in. That that really is Hera Sandula from Star Wars Rebels. Uh, the ghost is parked outside um, uh, on Yavin here um, for a brief moment. And so, again, there's lots of little things that get thrown in at the last minute. When, when, when we do these premieres, they, they they invite all of the you know the rebel legion the 501st legion the mandalorian mercs like all the really hardcore guys and it's interesting to see how the different kind of easter eggs play out at different levels like when people see darth vader everyone goes ooh because we all know darth vader but like when when chopper rolls by it's like six people in the back that go oh my god it's like, those are the only guys that spotted it but they do spot it i really like these uh blue squadron light suits they made the kind of the gun blue uh, you see a lot of these, a lot of cosplayers have really uh, adopted that. I've seen a lot of Blue Squadron uh, pilots at uh, conventions and, and events uh, since this movie came out. My favorite thing about that is that they didn't have Blue Squadron in the original because it interfered with the with the blue blue string. Yeah, they couldn't have right. blue X wings because it would just key out. Right, and you know, and and in terms of the storytelling, they all get this is it. None of them. Yeah, Blue Squadron and Red Five. Get them out of there. Red Five. So I, so I'm the guy who killed Red Five. Oh no! You that I should get to play him, but they didn't. They they, they cast. Dead. <laughs> and of course, there's going to be that amazing um, restored footage. The uh, red leader, gold leader stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah that's that's absolutely so, amazing. I, that, you know, we be, being there at the premiere, that. like at the premiere, which is like a very like. And it, to a degree, it's kind of a formalized occasion, right? But when that stuff came on, you could feel it. Uh, we were not, you, you and I were elbowing each other, Chris. Yeah. You know what they've done here? I asked Gareth about it afterwards. He explained to me how when when the shot. We'll talk about yeah. it, but some of the stuff that they that they did um, to create those shots is amazing. But the, all the all the design and all like the color grading and even like the haircuts just they line up so well with it. So it it really. Does. Just a, a phenomenal kind of segue into A New Hope. Right, yeah. I mean, they've got 70s sci-fi haircuts, right? Mm -hmm. um, not oh, yeah. they, also, they, they were called legacy doubles. They all had like, bad 70s wigs. <laughs> There's a lot of the stuff you got to think about here. Like, you know, I, I, it would have been nice to put Wedge uh, here. But there's yeah. a line in A New Hope where um, uh, Wedge says, look at the size of that thing. And it's very clear as he's seeing the Death Star that he's seeing it for the first time. Red Leader and the other pilots are like, whatever. They, they saw this thing yesterday, so it's less impressive to them. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's the shot right there. Uh, Red Leader. Here's Red Leader. I mean, so I what you did was they went to the Skywalker archives, and they, those aren't actually shots from A New Hope. Those are alternate takes that never got used. But they found them, digitally cleaned them up, matched them with the, with the extra footage, and even tracked down the original actors and had them re-record uh, new dialogue. That's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And again, everything you're seeing here is very, very heavily influenced by and inspired by Return of the Jedi. This was originally Admiral Ackbar, seat of the um, uh, profundity there in the command seat. Uh, but uh, I think you just a uh, big, big dark rider there. Yeah, uh, I think I think we kind of felt that we didn't want to overuse um, uh, Ackbar, uh, and so Gareth came up with this character, Admiral Radus, who was very much inspired. He wanted a Churchillian character.
character. He said, "Give me, give me, a, give me a Mon Calamari that looks like Winston Churchill." Um, <laughs> and that's what they came up with. This is just a fantastic concept, right? Just diving straight into this. Oh, I love, and there's a there's a sound effect right on there that it's that classic like Ben Burt and a metal cable kind of right. like kind of thing that's happening there. And again, you'll notice anytime those smaller ships ship like get a better that relative speed because x-wings are really fast and tie fighters are really fast but you don't always appreciate that unless there's something in the background uh, to contextualize it oh by the way i just got a text from my um my uh, seven-year-old who's watching downstairs uh there's a character called pow who's named after him and he's asking if his character survives and i'm going to tell him <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does, Paolo. If you're listening, <laughs> he makes it. He gets off planet. <laughs> that would have been incredible if we all got to be here when he told him no. He's <laughs> <laughs> it's the lizard, the lizardy looking. The lizard like. guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Paolo is very concerned about um, kinds of things yeah. in the movies, whether people end up okay or not. What a sweet little moment here between between these two characters. Yeah, he always wanted a weapon. And of course he ends up going out in a blaze of glory. Right. As as he always did. We always kind of felt like, well, someone's gonna be the droid. You're gonna like the droid, you know, we some some droids. Uh, but we felt like yeah, I, I always felt like someone's someone's gonna die on this mission. It can't be like free of sacrifice. And so K2 always kind of died in a in a in a special uh moment. But then of course by the time Chris and Tony uh, were done. They had killed pretty much everybody. <laughs> I, I love this rocket. The the way that it just shrugs off the rocket just, launcher. Just nothing. Yeah. And his reaction to it too is. But then you know a little bit, a little bit more here. Look at that. Oh my god. I, yeah, I love baby. this. Again. It's just a great. <laughs> I mean, that's last saving Private Ryan, kind of. Right. Moment, right. right. Uh, what I would give to be one of those pilots, man. It's a real thrill standing next to one of those. I, I, you know it's not really matter. Like standing next to one of those full-size X-Wings, is just, it's magic. Yeah. Awesome. Now, they created all this kind of extra complication of business where they've got a kind of cable one place to another and stuff like that just to kind of you know give them some more obstacles to uh to deal with i love that i just i love the way that they built that kind of that transparent floor so they so that radis can really kind of see what's happening on the surface makes sense i love that this is both like w like one of the darkest sort of tonally star wars movies but also it's so cold you got you know, you got stormtroopers at the beach, and like, you know, they're they're flying in the atmosphere, and it's like a beautiful blue sky out, and there's just mm -hmm. everywhere. And again, all again, all of these massive structures in the background just just give you all this, and again, especially here on the surface, you get just tremendous of how these ships are their environment. Yeah, Gary, I love this battle. Well done. I I still believe that the the, the Battle of Endor is the greatest space battle ever put on. Um, and this was, you know, in one small way, uh, an attempt to kind of pay tribute to it. To the guys you see, I'll second that. I'm, I'm, a big, I'm, I'm a big Return of the Jedi guy myself. In parallel. Was, you, this are you Mr. Stardust, Chris? No, I think that's uh, that, that's after me. I'm not okay. sure who's, who's that is. I think it may have been after you, but before Tony, actually. I can't remember. You thought you back. Some things I remember, some things I don't. But this, all the, the we always had this kind of thing inside the vault. They have to like pull the actual plans out. Big vault door. So we got a a comment on um, a thing that I think we did just just flew past us there while we were talking about something else. But uh, whose idea was it to? This is oh, I'm sorry. This is from uh, somebody watching on IGN.com. But whose idea was it to include slash cut off the I've got a bad feeling line? I think when, yeah, they're, when they're walking into the to the base there. Let me see. Was it you, Gary? I don't. I had I had a different version of it where Jin Jin said before they went on the mission, everyone was very nervous. 
I've got a good feeling about this, which we cut, right. and then it ended up being the you know the the kind of you know, you wanted, I wanted to reference it in one way, but without actually saying the line, uh, we ended up doing it in a in another in a different way. I, I thought it was kind of funny that they, that uh, they ended up using that line in solo. I've got a good feeling about this. Sooner again, sooner or later, someone's going to use it. Yeah, I mean, you got to ring the changes, right? Um, right? And you know, it's sort of sitting there waiting to be used. Uh, and and, that, and that's part of the challenge, I think, when you when you're dealing with um, you know really really well known stuff. It's like you you, you want to reference it, but you don't want to just say it. Like how 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 do you like riff on it or, or, or you know reference it in a in a way that is unexpected is is part of the challenge. God, they move so fast. I love those ships. <laughs> I love the I love the fact that they even bring the U wings the you know the troop carry, you know this was this was something that that Gareth wanted he wanted to to, to come up with a new kind of ship, um, and I liked the idea of you know you got A B X and Y uh, the you know the A wings B wings X wings and Y wings and I, I I wanted to kind of add something to that and so we came up with the idea of the U wing um, as a as a kind of a troop carrier that we this is more archival footage there as kind of a troop carrier that would help get help Jen and her team get it around. But could also play um, his poor, her poor old Red Five, uh, play a part in the uh, battle at the end. So you know, so obviously Luke Skywalker is Red Five in the Battle of Yavin. Uh, I liked the idea of, of 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 the audience seeing how that call sign became available. Goodbye, poor old Red Five. He's done. Here's, there's a question coming up on on a lot of, uh, and, and it's one I'm sure you've gotten before, but. Um, uh, there's a lot of footage from from this battle sequence that was in the trailers and not in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. So this is here's here's just one of them uh, from Galvatron Type R on IGN.com. Uh, for the writers, why was uh, so much from the trailers? Uh, Jen confronting the Tie Fighter on the tower. Jen and Cassie running on the beach. Uh, cut from the final movie. He just straight up asks why. So <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't think either of us would really necessarily have the answer to all of them. I, I've heard it on good authority that the the TIE fighter kind of hoving into view right in front of Jin was actually never intended to be used, that it was, you know, a sort of trailer-specific moment. Yeah. Um, even though it's a pretty awesome. I don't know how she would have gotten out of that one. Um, yeah, originally uh, the K, K2 died on the beach. I'm not always sure why these things happen. All I can say is that as you're sort of cutting together these things um, during production and in post, uh, you know, all kinds of sort of uh, narrative necessities arise. We're like, oh, well, we can't do that part anymore. They're going to have to get to the master switch or, you know, it, and so eventually these things get alighted and, and that, but nevertheless, some of these shots are so cool that they're perfect for trailers. Yeah. I, can, I can speak to it a little bit. My, my understanding is that when I originally wrote the battle, there were two separate facilities. There was the on Scarif on uh, on that stretch of beach. There was a vault, a building where the where the plans were held in the vault, and then there was a separate building which was like the communications tower, and they were separated by a stretch of beach. So part of the part of the mission was to liberate the plans from the from the vault, and then tra and then you had, then they had to get them across the beach uh, to the tower where the, from which they could transmit them. So when you see those scenes in the trailer of Jim of Jin, we actually shot those scenes. When you see Jin running with the with the Death Star plans in her hand across the beach, that's them trying to get from one building, uh, from where they from the vault where they stole the plans to the comms tower where they could transmit them. I think as they looked at what they had, they realized that the battle there was just too many moving parts. Like it was too complicated. They wanted to simplify it, and 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 the solution, quite I, I think quite elegant solution, was just to put both the the vault and the tower in the same complex. So it was all it all happened in the same building. That makes sense. But then on top of that, all this stuff about the master switch was, was then subsequently added as and and then added other degrees of complexity uh, as well. Sure. So yeah, K2 at this point is dead, which is yeah, sad, but you kind of expect it. Someone's going to die. A bunch of red sh expect that as well. <laughs> But then, you know, it very slowly starts to creep up on you that uh, it might be getting a lot worse. Nobody's going to make it, yeah. Before it gets better, yeah. He's starting to get picked off one at a time here. I do love a good tragic droid 
you know, death. Right. Like, just he, has good, he has a good one. Yeah. K2 goes out like a like a pro. The guy who plays the um I can't remember the name of the actor or the horse, but I remember who just died there. I remember talking to him and saying, like, how cool is this? And he was just like, he just said, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, he was so thrilled <laughs> to be in that flight suit. Especially in, I mean, this taking place immediately before A New Hope and the way all the costume and the, you know, all the props and the haircuts and, you know, the way that all the the tech looks laid out, like, it's it's just, it's playing, right? Like, like everybody played this when they were kids. Right. Um, which is sort of sort of a different deal than than you know being in one of the uh, you know the sequel uh, films. Yeah, we all did this with action figures when we right. were kids, right? This is the same thing, only yeah. much more expensive. Exactly. I actually appreciate it because you always I would always take action figures to the beach and be like, they're at Tatooine, but there's a ton of water over here, and you just <laughs> cut up and now it's just the beach, so. I used to take my Han Solo uh, action figure and uh, ice cube in my freezer to, to freeze him in carbonite. And then I would, <laughs> and I would throw That's him awesome. out under the warm faucet. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, like, this this is a fan movie, really. Um, it, it, like, I think everybody, uh, almost everybody worked on this movie was, was deeply affected as a kid by Star yeah. Wars. Certainly Gareth was, you know. You can see pictures of him on vacation in Tunisia, like at, at the original um, sets, you know, yeah. uh, drinking milk that has been dyed blue in celebration <laughs> of being there. Uh, so we just got all these amazing toys to play with. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and again, as much as you check the fanboy at the front door, that stuff, there, there are... Um, you realize you realize you are you're playing with you, you get to play with the most expensive right. uh, box of action figures that, that anyone's ever going to be given, and it's, there's just pure joy in it. Here's another question that uh, uh, somebody named Nida on Cinefix uh, who's watching on Cinefix brought up uh, as, about this scene right here. Uh, I'd like to know if they ever considered letting Chirut pull the leveler using the Force. Was that ever no? An Nope, we never did. Um, in keeping with the notion that Jedi are gone, so uh, although Chiru can do all these amazing things, um, uh, it, it's all within this sort of theoretical scope of physics and, and human capability. Um, and no, the, the the notion was that uh, was that nobody nobody on our side has those manifests those powers yet. I've, I I really like Chris where you ended up setting the dial. He believes in force. He's a man. he may not, but he but he, he may not have ever, ever even really felt the force. So I certainly don't think he really has the power to use it. But there's just enough of a suggestion that maybe he is protected by in some way. Yeah. That his faith does actually mean something. But without it being any, anything as obvious as you know being a Jedi or, or or being in any in any way force sensitive. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um... Was oh, it you, man. Chris, who came up with I Am One with the Force? Yes. That, uh, that kind of end. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you, Gareth. Um, but say it again, because it sounds like you're saying something nice. Was, was, <laughs> it, was, it you, was it you who came up with the line? Say that. Um, I, yeah, I'm one with the Force, and the Force is with me, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, it goes on. There, it's a sort of a catechism, or... or, or uh, you know, twenty-third Psalm uh, for um, for Jedi's, um, but uh, I don't remember the exact words now. But that that's what I wanted was a, was a sort of a Lord's Prayer um, type of thing, right? Uh, but uh, it was honed down eventually just to one one statement. There's something there's I mean, something kind of beautiful and tragic in the idea that he believes passionately in the Force, but he may not ever have actually been touched by it. Do you know what I mean? Right. He, he still believed. Kind of love. Yeah, well, he's going back there now. Oh boy! Yeah, he'll 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 eventually rejoin with the uh, the living force. 
Uh, now finally the Y wings get to do something cool. I've never been a fan oh, of yeah. Y wings, but I'm glad they get something to do. I uh, always love them. My o my only real sadness is that I originally had B wings in this battle. I love the B wings, uh, uh, and we never used them. Is there anything else that that uh, the the fanboy tried to get in there, but but failed? I mean, something million. along the lines of the like, I, I could really be things. here all night if I could. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can't help yourself. I don't remember. I think the ghost is actually present in this battle as well. I can't remember. I think that's right. I, I believe it is here. It's hidden somewhere in one of the formations. Here, now that uh, that Chirut has met his end, well, and here we go. Anybody can go. Everybody, everybody's and, gone. And this is when you start to realize, oh. And, and what I love about it is like you don't they don't dwell on it. It's just something that happens, yeah. right? There's a moment to recognize that one of them has been lost, but then but the, but like you got to there's no time to, to mess about like you've got to keep the mission's not over yet. You got to keep going. And this, well, is, this I think, is, is really the first sense that like, oh, maybe not everyone's going to going to make it out. Yeah. What's great is this the sequence here with Baze is is really the first gen is is the spot where you actually get to to realize that because you can see, kind of see him realizing that you know he sees the ship explode from far away and All right yeah i mean so so the death toll so far is what k2 chirrut bays and bodhi all gone right yeah. so that's pretty that's that's the bulk of them it's really only uh Jin and cast point well now that now that some of them are gone there's here's a question from uh hobbit ninja I uh, was watching on YouTube. Uh, was there any? Uh, were there more Donnie Yen fight scenes that that got cut? I don't think so. I mean, yeah, certainly more Donnie Yen fight scenes the better, but uh, <laughs> right. I don't believe so. If you have a Donnie Yen fight scene, you keep it in. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna cut one. So um, this was this was added very late, but is a is a big favorite, right? The head attack, mm -hmm. the Hammerhead Corvette. These were introduced in Star Wars Rebels, and they get to play a major role here. I would not want to be on a crew of a Hammerhead Corvette. That seems like a bad assignment. And again, here at the top of the comms tower, this is stuff that we always imagine. ILM actually built a virtual version of this set. You could put on, you could put on a VR helmet and stand at the top of this tower and look down and feel like you were really like a thousand feet up. It was amazing with TIE fighters and X-Wings flying around you. Uh, and Gareth was actually able to walk around the set virtually to get a sense of the space before they built anything. And one last hurdle to clear here. Just one last thing. Never yeah. easy. IT. <laughs> <laughs> I wish IT was this exciting. Right. <laughs> At least it's not dangerous. Anytime somebody loses access to their email or something, you have to walk out on a big <laughs> thousand this feet is up. This is probably the most resonant moment in the movie. We've all complete at some point in our life, and this is like the first bar to wait for ever. So I can, I yeah. can I get the frustration. <laughs> you now, and again here, this, I mean, it's just the scale that. Oh, yeah. Huge. What's going on here? It's just these two, you know, one Star Destroyer just cutting through another like butter. It's incredible. Great shot. Look at this. Beautiful. And of course, this ends up bringing down the entire shield gate. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, Chris. That shot of the TIE fighter, I think, was only ever... There's another famous tunnel and lights kind of flicker on behind her that right. was used in trailers, but it was never intended for the movie. I think it was just like, literally on the day. I think Felicity was standing there, and it just looked like a great shot, and Gareth just wanted to get it. But I don't think he ever had a place for it in the movie. Which is great. I know a lot of people like to, you know, I mean, the, it wasn't in the trailer, or wasn't in the movie, but it made it in the trailer. Like, I, trailers and movies are two very different things. Like, I've, I've, I have never never mind that there's, uh, you know, a shot in the trailer that didn't make it in the movie. 
build a floor in the death star. Here's the question. This is probably the most important question we'll get to today. Just right here, as as we're seeing this standoff between Ben Mendelsohn here and uh, Papa Jones 007, who's watching on uh, YouTube on IGN's channel. Uh, why are the villains uh, all in Star Wars always English or Australian? Uh, I think because the, the the original movies were made by Americans, and we we have a, a vestigial memory of. Uh, of uh, the British Empire. <laughs> I want to say I want to say it's because they film all of the clean imperial hallway scenes British studios. Yes, that's it's very always cool. like Shepperton yeah. or Pinewood, you know. Yeah, and you know I don't know what it is. It, 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 it says it's baked inherently about the British accent. Um, you know, something I've struggled with all my life. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, and and you know, there's also this sense, of course, that you know, only recent trilogy did they ever, you know, break out of this idea. But I always liked the idea that you know, the Empire is very much not an equal in, uh, opportunity employer. It's a bunch of old white dudes, and you know, whereas the whereas the rebellion is much more kind of a rainbow coalition of people of different ethnicities and cultures and species, all kind of you know, it's whoever whoever is willing uh, to join the rebellion. Um, but the Empire t t t typically has only ever been, um, you know, the, the old white dudes. That shot there, the, the, the original shot of the Death Star plans, John Knoll, uh, that was actually one of the very, in the original movie in 77 Star Wars, uh, that schematic, that kind of 3D rotating Death Star was one of the very, very first CG effects ever created for a feature film. Mm. Uh, and John went and found that and recreated it and actually, but we never use it in the movie, but I think just for fun, because he's a nerd, he recreated that entire schematic Everything from the, ro the, the the rotating all the way down to the trench run and the exhaust port. He did it. He completed it in a way that had never been completed before. And of course, it's just a nice little callback for fans that recognize that original schematic uh, as it's as it's pulled out of R two D two in the original movie. Um, uh, it's just a, just a nice callback. So, oh yeah, those are the Death Star plans. I remember what those looked like. Mm -hmm. So the the question here always arises: Is there something romantic? Um, I was I'm, just I'm, I was just gonna bring up we have a a, a commenter uh, Zeno Saga Girl three on Discord has asked mm -hmm. the same thing. It's such great chemistry between Jen and Cassian. Right. Uh, was it was it a romantic potential ever there in, in any of your scripts? It was definitely a possibility. Yeah, uh, for sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it was shot either. And and uh, you know, uh, I like kissing and that's very nice and stuff. <laughs> but I think that there is a the the trope that every male and female. Um, you know, hero have to kiss, have to be romantically involved is maybe something that it was good to uh, just sidestep in this one. It's clear okay. that they have it. Very, deep very, connection. very early on, there was more romantic chemistry, and I think it got it, it got scaled back less and less and less until now. I think it really is just kind of like a mutual respect um, that they have. They're obviously growing very close, but I don't think there's ever the hint of romantic. And I remember a lot of people finding that very refreshing that, that the movie never went that route. I think, yeah, I, it seems like one that we don't need it. Like the, what they've been through is the meaningful part, right? Like, the, 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 the stuff that's happening around them is too important for anything like that thing. And it speaks uh, to their character that they wouldn't, you know, let that sort of intrude. And this, and this is what I mean about kind of the beauty of a triumphant death that you see in, in great, great movies. They, they know it. Dead. They, they just know it. But, and yet their final emotion is going to be one of triumph because they also know that they, that they did what they came here to do. And that's what matters. It kind of looks like they walk off into the sunset, but it's really more right. like a <laughs> cloud. Yeah. Yeah. It's, more, it's, yeah. more like, it's more like the sunset walking into them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I love the scene. Yeah. Uh, look, they're going straight to the force. They're going to be. They're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Um, yeah, they've 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 earned their place. So now we're sneaking up uh, on. You know, we just saw a shot of Darth Vader. He's arrived on yeah. the scene with his fleet. We have had so many questions and comments uh, come in so far uh, about. The decision to include or not include Darth Vader, how much Darth Vader was left on the mm -hmm. cutting room floor. We've got, just to name a few of the people that have asked questions, there's Dennis Haas on IGN YouTube, uh, Bad for Education is another user on YouTube, uh, Air, Pokemon, Naruto22, everybody's mm -hmm. got to know. How, uh, um, there, there was always going to be some Vader. 
question is like how much because you don't want him to overwhelm things. Thank God he's here to like raise our spirits and some badassery after. Yeah, and after and and, and, and here of course is like everyone's favorite scene in the movie, and 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 rightly so. You were just gonna quietly watch this, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All. <laughs> Let's have some respectful silence for this scene. Oh, it's so good. Honestly, it was one of the first things when I got my Disney Plus subscription, I went straight to this scene. It was one of the first things that I watched. Now, what I a... wish I could take credit for that. I think it's it's the suggestion of an editor. It was. It was Colin Gowdy, uh, one of the editors on the film, who said to Gareth, need something at the end here. And boy, was he right. Uh, Gareth went back and reshot this. Uh, sorry, not reshot. He went back and shot this very, very late. I believe Peter Jackson was on the set this day watching him shoot this. Uh, and it's just an incredible scene. I actually pitched an early. A, 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 that, that's actually Gareth there. Uh, the guy who pulls the lever that releases the Tantier Four. That's Gareth Edwards, the director. That's his little cameo in the movie. Um, well, his didn't get cut, but yours did. That's... No, well, yeah, that that was, it's nice to be. It's nice to be the. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I always like the idea of like we've seen Vader, the Jedi seen him like toy with people but we've never seen that sense of like that true asymmetrical warfare like what happens if you put darth vader in a room with like 50 highly trained rebel soldiers well the answer of course is just straight up murders all of them but what an amazing thing it is to actually see happen hey, you mentioned earlier there was uh, some more leia in in the script at some point it, you know it, it vacillated it went back and forth i think the final shot Everyone cheers when they when they see Leia at the end. Ends on the right note. Hey, here's, here's, here's the best scene of the movie, Chris, right here. There's those blue letters. <laughs> this is Yay, my favorite the part. Blue letters. Yeah. Everyone loves them. <laughs> there we go. Everybody loves the blue letters. Uh, well, guys, thanks for joining us. If if you don't mind sticking around, we can we can, we can grab one or two more questions. Uh, sure. Um, that came up. One of them. Um, Sort of not about this movie, there's uh, uh, Christopher Payne, who's watching on Cinefix, asks, uh, if you were given another standalone story to write, what sort of story would you want to tell in the Star Wars universe? Ooh. You go, Gary. It's something I've thought about from time to time. You know, I, I, I can speak only for myself. I worked for, I got to work Rogue One, I got to work on two seasons of Star Wars Rebels. I got to write the uh, the Marvel graphic, uh, Marvel comics graphic novel adaptation of the Last Jedi, and I've worked in uh, on the kind of the literature side as well. You know, I'm 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 very very privileged to have done the work that I've done in Star Wars. I think it'll always be the thing that I'm I'm kind of proudest of. I could work for 50 more years in this business, but Rogue One will always be the number one thing on my resume. I, I suspect, and rightly so. Um, I, if if Lucasfilm ever wanted me to do more, if they wanted Chris, we'd be we'd be there. Uh, in a heartbeat, but that's that's really up to them. And I and I'm not gonna say I have ideas, but I know that if I say anything, it's gonna be 50 clickbait headlines the next day. So I'm just not sure. gonna go down that road. Well, that's what we're trying to get out of you, dude. That's yeah, I, some clickbait. yeah I, I guess we're I done. Know, man. <laughs> I like the guy with the devil horn smile and oh, works nicely. Cardu Sai Malak, otherwise known as Labria. <laughs> <laughs> beloved Deveronian, yes. war criminal on the run. Family oh, is he? Oh, I don't like him as much anymore. Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, hang on a second. I think he just seemed like a fun guy to hang out with. He's a drunk who loves jazz. He's great. That's not canon anymore, but whatever. You know, well, I, I'm I'm all it's in on, on Borgullet. In your heart, Borgullet is my dude. I want to just live inside his brain and the memories he has sucked out of people. I want to see the full Borgullet story. That's like that. That, is... that, that, that that thing that you pitched, Chris, about how she had to give up, uh, trade her traumatic memories to Gullet to get some of him. That's brilliant. I, That's I, I super cool. Wish that been in oh, the nice. Could have been fun. Yeah. Oh, very kind. Well, uh, it was in the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's another sort of following up on on um on that question is a uh baron thomas who's also watching on youtube asks uh is a rogue two ever a possibility not literally or in the title but more movies about rebel versus empires rebels versus empire squad of x ring wings movie a star wars infantry type movie uh i guess uh, asking more about those like sort of the, the war movie inspirations that you guys have been talking about this um this whole time well, it's above our pay grade for sure to answer that question. Um, I mean, I think that at this, you know, th these things are such huge financial undertakings that um, 
uh, I think they're always kind of wanting to tie it into some sense of greater uh, uh, of the greater story. Um, and much as I would love to see, you know, more uh, of uh, of that third act that Gary uh, brought to life, um, I think it's probably relatively unlikely on the big screen. But but the the streamers offer, you know, the streaming service offers the chance of all of these really interesting possibilities. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the most interesting stuff that. To be one, see and show. I think, you know, as Chris says, like what, now that we're done, like whatever circle of trust we were once in, we have now been removed from, <laughs> uh, and that and that's not a diss or a slight. It's simply because the, we know we, you know, it's Lucasfilm operates on a need to know basis, and we no longer need to know. Uh, and in a way, that's kind of nice because we get to go back to being fans again. We 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 served, uh, we we fought in the wars. We have amazing stories. We got to contribute something to the Star Wars canon, which. Uh, you know, will 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 always be to be special to us. Uh, but now we get to go back to being fans again and being surprised by what they come up with next. Cool. So it, we'll we'll wrap up then with one more question about uh, about Rogue One. Then um, uh, this user on IGN YouTube uh, who wants to ask: Can you please specify about cut Vader scenes? Can you can you offer any any specific details about any of the Vader scenes that didn't make it in? Um, I don't think there were any. I think that, you know, the only, the only Vader with Krennic, which you see in the movie, again, the feeling was, you know, he's an iconic character. We want to have an iconic character in the film that makes storytelling sense, but let's not overuse him. The, the, the tendency can be to overuse these characters. Um, and so I think a little dabble do you. Um, again, I originally pitched, so I originally pitched a version. I never wrote it, but I pitched a, a version of that, that Vader scene. Uh, in the hallway, which was uh, actually out on the beach in Scarif, where the idea was that uh, Jin and Cassian had gone up the tower and the rebels had kind of bunkered in around it to prevent any, any Imperials following them, following them up. And the word got back to Vader and he started to we, we can't get to the tower because they've, the rebels have blockaded it. And Vader says, put me on that beach. I'll open the door for you. And he goes down there and just straight up murders every rebel on that <laughs> beach. And that would have been a cool scene. But again, it never really got past the pitch process. I never wrote it. But I love the fact that the idea of that scene ended up making it into the movie um, in the hallway, which I actually think works better because it's more contained. It's more claustrophobic. It's more, I mean, you're trapped in that room with him. And I think that's more scary. Yeah. Um, actually, going to do one more. This is um, about, there's a user on Cinefix, Baron Thomas, is asking, was West End Games Star Wars role-playing game an influence on any of you guys? And were any of you... Uh, former gamers, uh, Chris. I know your 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 D and D character made it in. Yeah. Well, I, I was a D and D player. Uh, had Traveler and Gamma World, but I believe the Star Wars RPG game was pat was was after my time in terms of gaming window. Before you realize, you should probably move on to something uh, something else. Now it's all coming back, of course. Um, but uh, I have to answer no uh, uh, with regret. That particular yeah. game. I mean, as, as 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 you know, I come from a gaming background. Gamer playing video games during during those kind of drought years uh, between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. You know, kind of late eighties, early nineties. Um, there were there were books, there were comics, but a lot of people forget that what really a, a, a big medium that carried the can. Uh, for Star Wars storytelling on the on the screen was the video games, Dark Forces, Tie Fighter, Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, you know, even Pod. I love the episode one racer. I'm so glad that's coming to Nintendo Switch. Uh, there was some great storytelling. Yes, Kotor to this day is tremendous, tremendous. Uh, uh, the Tie Fighter games that I mentioned, uh, you know, the Dark Forces, Jedi Knight. Um, that for for about for at least a decade, those video games were the experience Star Wars storytelling on screen with music and actors and voices and you know that kind of stuff and so um i often think the video games don't get enough credit um for being a really important part of the extended star wars canon yeah absolutely well guys uh, thank you so much again for joining us uh really it's fascinating stuff i loved hearing about how how this movie came together thank um, you
Thanks, everybody again, watched. Yeah, yeah thank you fun. for everybody watching. And again, uh, check out stackup.org and the International Rescue Committee. Information about that is down there in the description. Uh, and don't forget about Gary's Twitch uh, after party either. Yes, twitch.tv slash Gary Witter, G-A-R-Y-U-H-R-A. I'm going to hop over there right now once we're done. Uh, maybe answer a couple more Rogue One questions, maybe play some Animal Crossing, who knows. But I uh, hope some of you will come <laughs> over uh, and join me there. Yeah, get over there and uh, and thank you again for watching. We'll see you guys next week here on Washman Home Theater. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thanks, guys.